Good morning. An email was sent to my chambers um, at 5.52 p.m. yesterday uh, by someone by the name of Chris Wilson, who I don't know whether it's the Chris Wilson who's on the witness list or not, complaining about the violation of my court order uh, prohibiting the disclosure of the identity of jurors, uh, did not respond to the email, and I'll make the email part of the record in the case. And if counsel can look at it if, if you like. Court reporter has a court's exhibit. <clears throat> the court's exhibit number two. I, no, I don't need it. You can keep it. Any comment by the state or the defense? No, Your Honor. None, none from Mr. Murdo. None from the state, Your Honor. No. Anything before the jury comes? Uh, nothing from the state, Your Honor. <clears throat> Your Honor, um, the video he is about to show has, I believe, and I believe he agrees, images which are under the order signed by you. Um, and so as they're being proposed to be shown, if I have something or he has something, we're going to, obviously under that order, we have to disclose that to you. Um, and if you approve the showing, um, we've got some logistical issues. If you give me just a minute, um, these monitors are, that one is not working, but these, this monitor is viewable by, from the audience, and we'd like to cover it up with some um, MacGyver-like device that's been developed by Mr. Uh, Waters, where you take paper, we can flip back and forth. So. Um, if somebody has some, some tape, I'd like to do that before he begins so that nothing's shown back there by the end of the And we have paper too. I'm sorry. <coughs> That's going to die, I think. Is that a compliment? Thank you. 
Thank you. You may bring the jury. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, uh, for day number, I guess day number four of this session of court, uh, day number two of this trial. As I instructed you prior to um, us be commencing yesterday with the uh, opening statements, you're not to um, listen, watch, or uh, read any news accounts of this case or discuss it with anyone or allow anyone to discuss it with you or in your presence. Uh, has that occurred as to any jurors? All right, very good. It's very important that you keep that, um, follow that instruction. I know that many of you are not accustomed to sitting uh, for long periods of time and certainly not in settings like this, uh, but if, if at any time you need a break, uh, notify the bailiff who will bring it to my attention or raise your hand so that I could see and we'll take a break 
at any time any juror would need a break, or any court participant for that matter. Are we ready to proceed by the state? Yes, we are, Your Honor. <clears throat> yes, sir. Your Honor, the state would call Sergeant Daniel Green. The testimony you give to the court in this trial will be the truth, so help you God. I do. Thank you. You may have a seat. Adjust that microphone so that it fits you comfortably. And if you'll state your name and spell your last name for the record. My full name is Daniel Green. My last name is G-R-E-E-N-E. -E. Sergeant Green, how are you doing today? I'm good. All right. Uh, tell us where you work. I work for the Colton County Sheriff's Office. Okay. And your rank is sergeant, obviously. Is that correct? That's correct. Uh, tell us just a little bit about yourself. Just give us just a little bit of your background that led you to your career in law enforcement, if you would, please. Sure. Um, I went to school here, grew up here, went to college at Charleston Southern University. Uh, I got a degree in social studies education, taught for a little while, and then got into law enforcement. Just kind of fell into it and liked it. Um, and I've been here since 2014. Okay. Uh, you started with the uh, Sheriff's Department in 2014? That's correct. All right, and what, did you, what was your first job uh, that you did, or how, how does your career progress? I started at the jail. I worked there for just over a year, and then I was moved to the road patrol. Um, I was on road patrol for several years. Uh, moved up the ranks to sergeant, where I was a road patrol supervisor, and now I'm a detective. Okay. When did you become detective? Uh, earlier last year. Uh, it would have been June of last year. Back in June of 2021, what was your uh, job at that particular time with the Sheriff's Department? In June of 2021, I was a road patrol sergeant supervisor. All right, and explain how that works. What's your, what's your exact role as a sergeant and a road patrol supervisor? Uh, so for the most part, I'm assigned a team uh, consisting of three to four deputies, just depends, um, that include a corporal as well as several other deputies. My job primarily is to uh, supervise them in, their, um, in a 12-hour shift um, we answer calls for service. Um, sometimes I'll go with other deputies to calls that require more than one officer to be present. Uh, but m the majority of my job is supervising what they do. And during June of 2021, were you working day shift or night shift, or how did that work? I was on night shift at that point. And what are, what are the hours of the night shift? So we swap every two months. Uh, so two months you'll be on days, two months you'll be on nights. Um, for those hours, it's 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. or 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. Okay. And uh, let me take you uh, to the evening of June 7th, 2021. Were you working that particular evening? I was. And what shift were you working that, that day? We were on night shift. All right. And again, so what hours would that be? Working from 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. So you went on duty at 6 p.m. Is that I did. Right? Yeah. Okay. And uh, you said you're the sergeant. What, what was the, do you have a squad that you're supervising that are out during that shift? Uh, explain that to the jury, if you would, please. So that shift consisted of myself being the sergeant. I had a corporal and two deputies working as well. Um, and at that point, I had a lieutenant who was my immediate supervisor. He was working as well. All right, and again, you tell me who those people were? Sure, so my corporal was Corporal Janicki, and the two deputies working with me were Deputy <coughs> William Pruitt and Deputy Chad McDowell. And the lieutenant was who? Uh, lieutenant Lonnie Nettles. Um, did you, uh, on the evening of June 7th, 2021, uh, get a call for service at 4147 Moselle Road? I did. And you remember approximately what time that was? Uh, was later in the evening, several hours into my shift. Okay. And uh, did you ultimately respond to that location? I did. What was reported to you uh, that led to the call for service from the dispatch? that there was a caller who stated he had found his wife and son shot. And uh, so tell me what happens then. You get that report, what do you do? So I get that call for service. Uh, obviously we immediately respond in situations like that. We would respond with lights and sirens to get there as fast, as quickly as possible. You're driving fast yeah. to get there? Yes. Okay. Um, the lights are on? Lights were on, siren was on. Um, I think it still took me close to 20 minutes to actually get to the scene from where I was. Um, but you have to ask dispatch to clarify the address? I did once I got out there. It's a very dark area, very rural area uh, on Moselle Road. 
Uh, there were not a whole lot of residences in the area, and I did need clarification once I got out there to confirm the address. Then I located the address on a mailbox uh, across the street from a driveway. So you saw the mailbox in the driveway you entered, is that correct? That's correct. Uh, the driveway that you entered that had this mailbox, where did it ultimately lead? What structures were there as you pulled up to the scene? Uh, as, as I pulled down the long driveway, when I got to the end of it, there was a dog kennel area on the left as well as a shed area on the right. Okay. And that was the driveway with the mailbox, correct? That was. Uh, is this location where the scene was, is it in Colleton County? It is. Um, Tell me just a little bit before we get into more specifics. What was the, uh, you said it was dark. What, what was the weather like? What was the, uh, the conditions of the scene uh, or the weather and the scene like? So quite normal for June around here. It's um, rather hot and humid. It had been raining a little bit off and on that evening. It was not raining at the time that I actually responded to the scene. Okay. Uh, were you uh, the first um, law enforcement officer or first responder on the scene? I was. Uh, were there others, uh, other first responders following close behind? The additional first responder that was directly behind me uh, worked for Carlton County Fire Rescue. He pulled in almost the same time I did. When you would arrive at the scene, before we talk about you know, what you actually experienced at this scene, what is your main job at a scene like this? What are you there to do as a first responder, the first officer on the scene? Yeah, so a major crime scene like that, my job is to get there, secure the scene. And what I mean by secure the scene is ensure that there are no uh, individuals there that would potentially cause harm to additional first responders coming there or any witnesses or victims that are already on scene, uh, preserve any evidence that might be there, um, and then wait for investigators to arrive as I gather information from anybody else that is already on scene. Okay. So you, you're going to gather basic information, but your job's not to investigate it in great detail. That's that correct. correct. Okay. Um, as you arrived at this scene, again, what had been reported to you by dispatch? That a male caller had called and said he found his wife and son shot. And from that report to you, about how long did it take you to uh, ultimately make it onto the scene? It was roughly about 20 minutes. Okay. When you arrived on scene, uh, where you when you said one of the things that you do is secure the scene, were you at all concerned about any perpetrators still being there at that point in time? When I arrived, not necessarily, just because he had already been there for quite a while. Um, whenever he called, it seemed the way the call came in that uh, he discovered them like that and that there was nobody else there other than him and the wife and son. So you're the first officer on scene, but you're not thinking the perpetrators are still there. They just the It's something you have to keep in the back of your mind, but not necessarily at the forefront. Okay. All right. um, you didn't come in hot with guns drawn or anything like that? No. Um, When you arrived at the scene and you walked uh, and got out of your car, what did you see? So as soon as I got out of my vehicle, I was walking down the rest of the driveway, which went between the dog kennel and the shed. Um, as I, I could see Mr. Murdaugh down at the end of the driveway. Um, as I approached toward him, I could see the male victim laying on the ground to my left, as well as the female victim on the ground to my right. Um, the male victim was close to a small shed in the dog kennel on the left. There was a large deal of blood that had pooled around his body. Um, same thing for the female victim on the right. Uh, also a large amount of blood around her body. As you uh, approached and at first saw the male victim and the female victim, uh, what was your assessment? Was there any possible signs of life from your... Uh, my, initial, my initial assessment was that there was not. Uh, there, there appeared to be a large amount of blood around each of them, as well as um, brain matter. Uh, did you ultimately have a conversation with Mr. Murdoch when you were out there? I did. Right. And do you see him here in the courtroom today, the person yeah. that you talked to? I do. And can you point him out to the jury, please? Yes, sir. He's right there wearing a dark blue or black jacket. Your Honor, can the record reflect that he's identified Mr. Murdoch? It does. Um, when you ultimately approached Mr. Murdoch, what's the first thing that you did? Uh, the first thing I did was uh, ensure that he did not have any weapons on him. That's standard procedure for arriving on a scene like that. Um, any kind of weapons that are anywhere on the scene, I want to be aware of just so I can know whether they're there or not. And if they are there, who has access to them at any point. Um, just, and that's for my safety as well as other responding officers and for anyone else that's on scene. Uh, did Mr. Murdoch give you any possible explanation for this when you approached him? His immediate reaction was to start telling me about an incident that had happened with his son uh, with a boating accident. 
with the boating accident? Yes, sir. Had you asked him anything about that? I did not. Uh, you ultimately, were you wearing a body-worn camera that particular day? I was. Yeah. Um, and um, you ultimately had uh, a conversation with Mr. Murdoch for extended, a fairly extended period of time, is that correct? That's correct. Um, did uh, you ever see any tears in your interactions with Mr. Murdoch? He did not appear to be crying. He was upset, but I did not see any visible tears. Um, did uh, Mr. Murdoch tell you that he had any sort of firearm? He did. He stated that he had um, left from that scene, went to the residence, um, grabbed a shotgun from that residence, and then brought it back because he felt like he needed to have it just in case something else were to happen. He told you he had gone back to the residence after finding the victims to get that gun. He did. Uh, what, what, if anything, did you do uh, once he told you that he had uh, gotten a gun? First, he pointed to where, or pointed out where the gun was. It was leaning against the uh, vehicle that he was driving at the time. Um, I could see that it was a camouflage shotgun. I spoke with him for a few more minutes, and just based off of how nervous he was acting and, and anxious and upset, I decided it was in everyone's best interest to get that shotgun and secure it in my vehicle so that no one else had access to it. Uh, so you put that shotgun in your vehicle, is that correct? I did. Uh, what did you ultimately do with that shotgun? Did you later turn it on over to additional law enforcement? Yes, after it was secured in my vehicle, once SLED arrived on scene to do their further investigation, it was then turned over to SLED. Bear with me one second. Admitted without objection. Um, may I ask that we uh, have the Elmo working, please? Judge, do you want to see it first? I believe it's submitted without objection. It's not a graphic image. Proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. May I publish it to the jury? Yes. <clears throat> All right, I'm going to put what's been marked as. put what's been marked as State's Exhibit 3 up on the screen and see if I can get it the right way. All right. You can't see. Can you see that? You probably can't I can. See. You can? All right. And uh, do you recognize the uh, what's in that particular image? I do. All right. And tell me what that is, please. That's the shotgun that I secured in my vehicle on the scene. Okay. Let's see. Uh,
Thank you, Mr. Waters. Yes, sir. Yeah. Sergeant Green, I'm going to show you what's been marked as Exhibit 4 for identification at this time. And see if you recognize this particular item. Yes, sir. That would be the shotgun that I secured. Right. Your Honor, this time we would move uh, Exhibit 4 into evidence. Objection. Sorry, Your Honor. Objection. No, sir. It's admitted. Uh, may I have Sergeant Green show this firearm to the jury? Be sure not to point at anybody, of course. You know the gauge that firearm is? It's complete the control gauge. Thank All right, uh, Sergeant Green, I'm going to show you one other document before we move on to some other matters. All right, Your Honor, uh, I believe, I believe uh, I'd move to admit that State's Exhibit 2 without objection. And no objection, Your Honor. All right, I'm going to show this exhibit to you real quick and see if you recognize this document. Yes, sir, that would be the chain of custody for the shotgun. All right, is there a signature on that document? It is. All right, and what does this chain document reflect? Can you just generally explain what this means to the jury, please? That I originally took possession of that weapon and then turned it over to SLED investigators. All right. May I publish this exhibit, Your Honor? Yes. <clears throat> So up here it lists that it, there was a Benelli Super Black Eagle. Did you unload this particular shotgun? I did not. Okay. But you ultimately turned the shotgun in its loaded state over to the agent listed here, is that correct? I did. I did. Did you alter or change the weapon in any way between the time you took it and the time you took it over to uh, the sled? No, I didn't manipulate it in any way. Sergeant Green, I'm going to show you what's been marked for identification at this time of State's Exhibit Number One and see if you recognize this. Yes, sir, I do. All right, and can you tell the jury what this is on this desk right here? That would be the body camera uh, footage from that incident. From the, your, your arrival at Moselle Road and uh, through the investigation until at some point you turned it off after you, it no longer needed to be on, is that That's correct? correct. All right, Your Honor, at this time I'll move to admit State's Exhibit Number One. That clarification, that is this officer's body cam, which is a, a camera that's mounted on his body, is that correct? That's correct, it's, it's mounted okay. on him. Yeah. So admit it. Your Honor, permission to publish this uh, exhibit to the jury. Um, I'll need the... Your Honor, I would point out that there are graphic images on this, so everybody needs to cover up their monitors, please. Parties to uh, control what is presented and published in accordance with the court's order. Uh, the parties to police that yourselves. Your Honor, we intend on covering the screen up when he gets to the graphic images and then uncovering it. Well, they, they come pretty quickly, I see. I remember. So, Mr. Griffin's ready.
Yeah, stay in town. I'm heading out there. Advise a female shot in the head. The son is shot also. And I was leaving. Send my mother. Sergeant Green, this is your body cam video, is that correct? That's correct. Uh, the first uh, 15 minutes or so of this video, are you running code, running at full speed or at least reasonable speed to get to this scene as fast as you can, is that correct? Yes, sir. My lights and, that, my lights and siren were activated so I can get there quickly. Your Honor, at this time I'm going to fast forward it until he arrives, I believe without objection from the defense. Without objection, Your Honor. Past the driveway that was that I was supposed to have turned down, like I said, everything was kind of dark out there. It wasn't clearly indicated, so. Central, that was four one four seven or five seven. Four one four seven. Keep your vehicle in the driveway with a flash of on. It's going to be the caller. Copy, I'm going on scene. It's got a long driveway, but the mailbox out front is labeled. It's not at the end of the driveway. It might be up by the house. The correct number for uh, 4147 Moselle? It is. And is that the incident location where you discovered the victims? That's correct. to the left of the screen. What did you see right there? To the left was uh, Paul's body. He was laying face down on the ground, large pool of blood around him, as well as a great deal of water that was immediately around his body. Was it, uh, that water, was it just around, was it down the entire kennel uh, concrete pad or was it mostly just? No, you could see walking down the kennel as I got out. The closer I got to Paul's body, the more water there was. Had it been raining enough at this point in time to wet the entire, to, to cause that amount of water? Objection, Your Honor, calls for speculation. Objections overruled. Answer the question, please. Uh, I, I don't recall if it had been raining a whole lot that evening, um, but given the, where the water was, it did not appear that rain had caused that water. Ladies and gentlemen, there is an objection. If I sustain the objection, you are to then disregard the question and any responses. If I overrule the objection, uh, then you may consider the responses and, and the question is deemed appropriate. You may proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. I'm gonna back it up just a little bit, apparently too far, so I'm just gonna roll from here again. What are we seeing to the right of this image? So on the right would be uh, Maggie's body, also laying face down on the ground, a large pool of blood around her head. And we see an individual standing. Who is that? The individual standing in the background would be Mr. Murdoch. The person you previously identified in this courtroom? That's correct. Both defense have one to the head. 
And just to be clear, this location that you're standing right now is in Colleton County, is that correct? It is, yes. Okay. It's in your vehicle. Do you have any guns on you at all? No, sir. Just leaning up against the side of my car. You're you're fine, man. You're fine. Turn around for me. I don't have any. Okay. Yes, sir. I see that. Okay. This is your wife and son. Okay. I noticed you shined your flashlight just a few seconds ago on the v the black vehicle. What did you shine your flashlight on just then? You could see the shotgun leaning up against the side of that vehicle. Um, were the flashers on on the uh, vehicle right there in the image? I believe so. Yes. Okay. It's bad. Check the pulses. Yes, sir. <laughs> this is the firearm you brought from inside the house, sir. Yes, sir. I went get. This is a long story. My son was in a boat wreck a, a few months back. He's been getting threats. Most of it's been benign stuff we didn't take serious. Okay. Um, you know, he, he's been getting, like, punched. Um, I know that's somebody, I know that's what it is. Okay. When did... Was that when you previously testified that he mentioned the boat case or the boat wreck? That's correct. Prior to me asking him anything about it, he did mention it. Did you get home? Right, um, right when you called, or did you go to the house first? Where is the house? I came to the house first. My mom has late stages Alzheimer's, and my dad is in the hospital. Okay. I left. I don't know what time. I can go back on my phone and tell you the exact times. Did you check? Okay. Did I check what? Did you check them? The, the, we got medical guys that are, that, that's, that's, that's what they're going to do, okay? Uh, what are they doing? Can they hurry? They are. Yes, sir. That, that gentleman that was out here already, he's one of the battalion chiefs, okay? Uh, Right before that discussion, did Mr. Murdoch offer to go on his phone and check? He did. Time? He did. He wanted to verify exactly the, the timing of his arrival. How did you pull up you, from back there? I, came, I went to the house and they weren't home, which was odd. I tried to call. Okay. And then I knew they had been down here before I left to go to my mom's. Okay. And so uh, that is loaded. Okay. Um, you might want to unload it. But, um, <laughs> is this the only firearm with you? Him, sir. This is the only one, or is there any more in the truck? I believe that's it. You think that's the only one? Okay. I'm 99%. Do you normally sure have any other firearms in your vehicle? I don't, but occasionally, okay. there, occasionally there's a pistol in there. Okay. So you're putting something on your hands. What are you doing right there? Those are just gloves so I could put on my hands to limit the contamination of any evidence. You put those on before you handle the firearm? Is that yes. correct? Just wait right here for me for a second, okay? What are you doing right now? At this point, I'm walking back to my vehicle to secure that shotgun inside my vehicle. We can actually see you holding it to the, uh, to the left of the screen, is that correct? That's correct. That's me holding the barrel of that shotgun. Explain to us real quick uh, a body-worn camera. Where is that located and where, where are these images coming from? I would have put it, I generally put it right here on my chest dead center of my chest. And how is it activated? How is it turned off? Can you explain that to the jury a little bit uh, as well? So most of these cameras are activated in the patrol vehicles uh, that deputies on patrol have. They're activated whenever you activate your blue lights. Uh, so as soon as I turn my blue lights on, it activates my dash camera as well as my body-worn camera. Okay. And then how do you ultimately turn it off? It's got a button on the front of it that you can press. Uh, if it did not originally activate it, you would press that button to turn it on to start the recording. And then whenever you're done recording, you press that same button to stop the recording. In this particular instance, how did it get activated? Was it when you turned on your blue lights to run code to the scene? That's correct. It was activated with my blue lights. And I've used the term run code. Do you know what that means? Yes. And can you explain that to the jury, please? Sure. Running code is just whenever you turn your lights on as well as your siren to get wherever you need to get fast. When you're moving quickly to respond to an emergency uh, situation. That's correct. Six, five, three, Well, 
Right there, you laid the shotgun inside your vehicle, is that correct? That's correct. I laid it in front of the passenger seat in the front. Did it remain there until it was turned over to SLED? It did. Uh, to the left of the screen, again, that's where the uh, Paul was, is that correct? That's correct. That's Paul laying on the ground. And is that uh, where you saw the water that you it described is. earlier? It is. Yes, yes, sir. That's what it, that's what it looks like. Where are you now? What is Mr. Murdoch doing at this particular time? He's on the phone, pacing around, talking to someone. I'm not sure who he was talking to at that point. Uh, did he ask you uh, to confirm if they were dead? He did. He asked multiple times while I was on scene. Did you ever see him any tears, any physical tears? I did not. Did you ever see him approach the bodies? I did not see him approach them, no. Did you observe any visible blood on him? There was no blood on him that I could see. The bodies, as you saw them, were was there a lot of blood around them given the injuries they had suffered? Yes, there was a pool of blood around each of the bodies that extended out from the body. All right. Yeah, the police are here now. The police are here now. Half hour minute. That's my brother. Okay. When was the last time you were here with them? Or talk to them or anything like that? Um. It was earlier tonight. Uh, I, don't, I don't know the exact time, but okay. I left. I was probably gone an hour and a half from my mom's, and I saw them about 45 minutes before that. Okay. I rode around with Paul for two hours this afternoon in the, in the pickup truck. That's your son, Paul? Okay. Somebody going to check him? Yes, sir. They, they've already checked them. <laughs> they did check them? Yes, sir. It's official that they're dead? Yes, sir. That's what it looks like. <laughs> When you observed these victims, was it obvious that they had injuries incompatible with life? Yes, any reasonable person that came upon those bodies would have come to a conclusion that they were deceased. Mm. I'm sorry. Mm. You're fine. Mm. I'm very sorry. Can I call her here? What, what's, what's her name? Her name's Maggie Murdoch. Margaret Brandstetter Murdoch. How you doing? What's her birthday? Um. Pause it right there. What did the defendant just say? Let me back it up. Margaret Brandstetter Murdoch. How you doing? What did the defendant say right there? So while I'm in the process of gathering information about the two victims from Mr. Murdaugh, somebody walks by behind me and he pauses what he's telling me to say, hey, how you doing? How you doing? Yeah. And who was that he said that to? I'm not 100% certain. I believe it was a fire rescue individual. What's her birthday? Um, 9-15-68. Okay. And what's your son's first name? You said Paul? Paul Carey Murdaugh. And what's his birthday? Jason, um, if you have anybody coming through town that can stop and pick up that tent, I see lights and off in the distance. What, are they covering them up? I got some getting dressed now, Sheriff. I'll help somebody stop and grab it. Tell them they don't have to do that. They don't need to. Preserve what we can. Six, five, three. Where is it at? I'm in town. I actually tried to be the old eight because he's going to be the only one that's got access. What's Paul's birthday? Got it. Um, um, April 14th, um, 1999, sir. Put it up as wide as you can. That's fine. 
You said 99? Sir? He was born in 99? He was born April 14th, 1999. Okay. What's your, what's your first name, sir? My name is Alex Richard Alexander Murdoch. Let me ask you this. In your interactions with Mr. Murdoch, was he able to understand your questions and respond appropriately to what you were asking? Yes. Was he catatonic in any way? No. He was able to answer all the questions that I asked him. Was he panicking in any way? He seemed upset, but I wouldn't say panicky. Uh, did you notice any labored breathing or anything like that from Mr. Murdoch? Yeah, he um, was breathing heavily. Uh, never once did he complain about um, not being able to breathe. I mean, there were fire rescue guys out there. He didn't ask for any kind of medical attention or anything like that due to not being able to breathe. Richard Alexander Murdoch. Cody, come around the truck and then go to the building. Come around the truck and then. Yes. What's that? There's a set of footprints behind the trailer there, too. Who's that individual right there? I'm not sure of his name. I just know that he works for Carlton County Fire Rescue. Carlton County Fire Rescue. In the background in the center of the screen, uh, it looks like somebody's doing something with some yellow tape. Can you explain what that is to the jury, please? That's correct. That's Deputy Pruitt, one of the deputies that I supervise. I instructed him to put up crime scene tape uh, to include that vehicle. Um, just to, we put up crime scene tape to try to keep people out of the immediate crime scene area, preserve, preserve any possible evidence that's there. At this point in time, had you known, noticed any evidence of uh, firearms such as casings or spent shells or anything like that? Yeah, as I was walking through, you can't necessarily see it on my body camera, but as I was walking through, I could see shell casings, particularly around Maggie's body. All right. And a shell casing, would they be for like a rifle round or a pistol round? They or? appear to be rifle rounds. Right. And could you tell just from walking by what type of ammunition at that point in time? I couldn't tell what type. I could tell that they appeared to be rifle, and that's about it. And again, you weren't stopping to collect those. You were, you were managing the scene as you described before. That's so. correct. shining your light on right there so there in the background behind where mr. Murdoch is standing you can see several sets of tire tracks um, the the grass was really wet that night so those tracks appeared to be really fresh so I, it caught my eye right. and why did it catch your eye it just seemed odd that there were it appeared to be that many sets of tire tracks since he said he pulled up went to the house and came back it just appeared that there were more than just that it appeared that there were more tracks than just that that's correct I see uh, quite a few tire tracks in here. Were any of these you going in and out? Uh, no, I came in here and I left one time and I came back. Okay. The rest of them, maybe. Okay. From earlier, but okay. only two were mine. Did you go out this way at all? No. No, it's right. Hey, hey, stay, stay here, stay here, stay here. Got a whole bunch of stuff right there. I don't want to stir. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm trying to get the door here so we can kind of get around that way. Your best way is probably going to be back through those rocks because we can't get any tracks off those yeah. rocks. Anymore. I'll go, we'll go back around the other way we just came. Okay. Thank you. Hey, Shane. Yes. Okay. I'll get that in a little bit. Then. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Whose 
vehicle are you approaching right now? That was the vehicle that Mr. Murdoch said that he had approached that scene in. Was that a black suburban to your recollection? It is. What unit's 23 on Moselle? House 70 unit off scene. Are you behind the house? There's several of us out here. There's Right there, that would be Maggie's body right in front of that shed. Is that correct? That's correct. It's covered up by a sheet at this point. A long dirt driveway right next to the mailbox says 4147, and you'll see all our lights down here at this shed thing. You ain't come through Brick Collins. Negative. Who's that standing way off in the in the distance there? That would be Mr. Murdoch. Where did he spend the majority of his time while you were there after your initial interaction with him? Uh, from this point on, his general time was spent in that area where he's currently standing. Pretty far away from the scene? That's correct. What was occurring right there? What was, the what was occurring right there? Yeah. So both of those deputies or Deputy Pruitt would be on the left and Deputy McDowell would be on the right. Uh, Deputy McDowell was taking small pieces of crime scene tape and just setting them by shell casings, I believe. Um, as road patrol officers, we don't generally have those little placards that you'll a lot of times see in crime scene photos. Um, but to prevent somebody from accidentally stepping them, stepping on them due to it being so dark out there, we tend to take something small like a piece of paper, a piece of crime scene tape, set it next to it just to indicate it a little bit better. Again, part of the job of first responder to sort of protect the scene until the uh, crime scene investigators get there. That's correct. Both these individuals, were you supervising them that night? I was, yes. <clears throat> Looking at this perspective right here, uh, to the left of the screen is whose body? To the left right there in the forefront would be Maggie, and in the further back you can also see where Paul is laying. Okay. Was Paul next to or in the kennel area? Yes. I think his brother. He said he was calling somebody. He said what? He said he was calling somebody. Yeah. There's a couple of showcases right there. Yeah, those will be easy to find. I was just marking a couple of them where it was in the ground, but it might be harder to see at some point. Y'all familiar with this family? Yes. Uh, I wasn't until he told me the names. Uh, last name. Last name. Did you know this family prior to this? I did not. I don't. I don't think there's going to be anything for me. What's that? Did that tell you? You said for Evo to do? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Hey. Who was Evo? Evo would be Deputy McDowell's K9. Hey, watch your step. Huh? Yeah. Okay. Who is that approaching right now? That would be my immediate supervisor at the time, Lieutenant Lonnie Nettles.
the gentleman in the white shirt is the husband of her, the father of him. That is Paul Murdoch. This is his mother. Paul Murdoch was that guy in the boating accident from a while back, if you remember. Yeah. Yeah. Just then, were you describing the boat wreck? Yes, I, it had been in local news previously, so. And it was your understanding that Paul was involved in that? In some way, I had no idea about the actual details of the case to know what his involvement was, honestly. Most likely. He did have a firearm whenever I pulled up. It's a shotgun. It's been secured in my vehicle. Give me just a few minutes, but yes, I will. That dispatch call, was that related to the case in any way? I don't believe it was. I don't remember what that phone call ended up being about. As a supervisor, if a lot of us are tied up at one time, they will tend to give me a phone call to let me know that a certain call is pending or something else is going on. Um, just to help keep the radio traffic free, they'll call me on my cell phone instead. Did your entire squad respond to this uh, this particular call, or did somebody? There was there was one deputy that remained in service. Okay, remained out, did not respond here, but remained on the road. Correct. Yeah. Six five three. Who's going? Who can start a log? Who's, who's the most expendable that can start a log? Let's put it that way. This is. Can you start a crime scene log, please? Uh, a log started. <clears throat> Sleds on the way. Let's push. Can we run the tape? 2007, Yes. From that last pole right there to that last pole. Get a piece of paper, start writing names and times. You don't have any kind of paper? Who's that individual right there in the center of the screen? To the right. Detective to the right? Yes. That would be Debbie Pruitt. And what did you just ask him to do? Uh, start a crime scene log. And tell the jury what that is. <clears throat> sure. So a crime scene log is established as soon as uh, additional people start to arrive on scene. We document exactly who comes into the actual crime scene as well as the exact time that they come into the crime scene. Here, borrow that. We can push it from that pole to that pole. Yep. Sure. I do see some that look old or fresh. here with the tape. So I'm securing it to the corner of that part of the shed to run it along to the a shed on the opposite side of that area. Uh, we just expanded the crime scene out a little bit further. To protect a larger area? Yes. <coughs> yes, sir. Either you need to speak more directly into the mic or can you increase the volume, uh, Madam Clerk, of his, of that mic? Just a little. This one that's working? Or? I'm referring to the witness. Oh, sorry. Increase his volume or? Thank you, Mark. Person. Yes, sir. I usually don't have a problem being too quiet, but uh, speak up for us if you would, please. Okay. All right, so you're securing the crime scene tape. Let's proceed. Keep our fingers crossed. 
Yeah, I think we got it. This is five three. All the responding units to Moselle Road stopped at the road. No one else come down the dirt road. Stop at the road. Here, 77. Oh, we doing that? 66 on 95. Coming. What's the other way up here? From back that way, I guess. Where the house is, I guess. Okay. You refer to the whiskey mic. Well, let me walk with a key. Permit. Heard on this video the term whiskey mike can you uh tell me what that term refers to yeah when we say whiskey mike we're referring to a white male a whiskey fox or a whiskey fox trial would be a white female and in the context of this particular scene who's the whiskey mike and who's the whiskey fox or whiskey fox trot as i was approaching you could hear me say to dispatch from my radio that there was a whiskey mike the whiskey mike referring to paul whiskey fox referring to maggie To the very right of the screen, um, well, strike that, I'll wait. Do you not have any crime scene log sheets? Hey, it's 717. I was asked to give you guys a call. I will inquire and I'll get back to you. Okay. Here, do you recognize those individuals? I do. Can you tell us who they are? On the far left would be Detective Tyndall. In the forefront toward the center would be uh, Captain Chapman. And on the other side of him, in the lighter colored shirt with the black vest, was uh, Barry McCroy, who worked for Fire Rescue. Okay. Uh, what, did the sheriff respond to this particular incident, to your recollection? Uh, yes, he did. Uh, but as far as who was the senior officer actually working the scene at this point in time until SLED arrives, who was it at this point? The, that would be Captain Chapman. Captain Chapman? That's correct. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm going to grab a couple. Well, I got some right here today. I'm going to grab a couple. Hey, you want us to close that in? Sir? What's that? You want us to close it in? Yeah. Then the guy. What the other guy knows, whoever Eric is, 
Is this the caller? There's a guy over here that's wanting to talk to him. I don't even know who Eric is. I know an Alex over Alec. there. Alex. Okay. okay. There's a guy over here that wants to talk to him. Yeah, but I didn't know if you wanted me to tell him that or if you wanted me to just chill for a minute. Or if you wanted me to escort him over. He does not need to walk over there. No, I mean a long way. He does not need to go over okay. there. So you can stay there then? He can. Let me ask you this. Uh, before you referred to um, a brother arriving, is that correct? Uh, yes. And was that a brother? Was he allowed to talk to Alec and go over to Alec? Uh, I, I believe he did. I don't recall. I never actually interacted with him at all. And then this discussion right here with, uh, with uh, Deputy Pruitt, what was going on right there? So there was someone that arrived on scene and wanted to go and speak with Mr. Murdaugh. Uh, I told him to just wait off, wait a minute on allowing him over there so we could determine the best way f to allow them to talk. Uh, simply because the crime scene was so large and we did not want to contaminate anything that didn't need to be. Okay. Uh, to your knowledge, was that individual, whoever it was, allowed to interact with Mr. Murdoch? I believe so. He was eventually, yes. People that arrived were allowed to go see Mr. Murdoch, is that correct? That's correct. He was not in custody at any time, is that correct? No. Female victim, male victim, male caller. And then the other guy, though, I mean, he hasn't came and tried to take it. Then don't have to worry about him. Um, just make sure you get the. Here. Do you recall? Yeah, so on those computers that are mounted in our patrol vehicles, we can see details of the call for service uh, or other calls for service. In this case, I was looking at the information for the incident on Moselle uh, to determine what units had been dispatched, what units arrived, and when they arrived due to Deputy Pruitt trying to establish the crime scene log. And you use the term call for service, which is a police term, but that essentially means responding to any emergency or... Any, any, any type of call. Any citizen that would call our dispatch center to request law enforcement assistance or fire rescue assistance, it's called, we just refer to it as a call for service. Came on scene at 2226. 2226? Yes. Yep. You say you came on scene at 2226? That's correct. For those of us who don't know military time, can you tell us what that is? That would be 1026 p.m. And that's June 7th, 2021? That's correct. And whoever U21 is with Fire Rescue, just write U21, Fire Rescue U21. And then that was the same time he, as you? he came on scene. Yeah, same time as me. It's fine. Medic 18 at 2227. Yep. Yeah, it started to rain more at this point. Yeah, it's, it had started raining at this point, yes. Seven five eight on scene twenty two thirty. Yep. Same time as you. Six five three on scene at twenty two thirty nine. Twenty two thirty nine. Yep. Those numbers uh, that you're referring to, what do those represent? So the numbers would be uh, the badge numbers of individuals arriving on scene. They're just recording when various people arrived on the computer. 
they're, they're recorded in the computer, so when we arrive on scene, we let dispatch know our number and that we're on scene. They log it into the computer, and then we can then put it on our crime scene log. That's all I have as far as times on this goes. Oak, wait, Tideville. 10-4. There's a Cottesville unit that can assist. That'd be great. Pretty sure Majestic Oaks is their jurisdiction anyway. Central Park 05. I'll believe that's in our jurisdiction anyway. I'll take care of that. Copy. Where's that located? Two two three Majestic Oaks. That individual walking off to the left of the screen, who was that? The one walking away from the screen or that just approached? Walking away. That was Deputy McDowell. All right, and then the center of the screen, who was that? The one that just walked up and is in the center screen now would be Captain Krause. All right, and then next to him, facing the, uh, the body camera? That would be Captain Chapman. All right, and then to the far right. Detective Tyndall. Were there dogs in those kennels to your recollection? There were a couple of dogs. I don't remember the exact number, but I do remember seeing some. That discussion right there, did that have anything to do with the crime scene or anything like that? No, it was not related at all. What did you just put on your hands then? Those would be latex gloves. And the gloves you put on that you described earlier to the jury, what were those gloves? Those are more tactical gloves. They're not necessarily ideal for handling any kind of evidence, but due to the, me already being out there next to the shotgun, I did not have any latex gloves on my person, so I used what was available. Right. And why are you putting on latex gloves right now? Uh, they were wanting to look under the sheet where Paul was, so just to prevent any kind of contamination of any possible evidence at all, you, we would just always put gloves on. Fire rescue might have some more sheets we That's can steal. Okay. That's right. It shouldn't be about five fifty There is wall part there back there. Yeah, it's it's a I don't think you're going to fit it in 300 black hair under there. 
Unless it's the shortest three hundred blackout seven days. I don't think he put that phone back. What is that discussion about right there? So the whole purpose for even trying to look up under him was to determine if there was an additional firearm on scene already, possibly under Paul. Um, there was 300 blackout casings found near Maggie. They were trying to determine if there was possibly a 300 blackout rifle under Paul. And why, why was, were y'all concerned that there may be one under Paul? We just trying to rule it out as a possibility. And what was that possibility then? That he could have shot Maggie. And then did what? Shot himself. So you're looking to see if there's a gun underneath if he had shot himself and then fallen on top of it. That's correct. I haven't asked the dad about the phone, but he dad did say he came over and checked the pulses. Did you see a phone near Paul when you arrived on the scene? Yes, there was a phone laying on top of him near his back pockets of his shorts. Back it up just a little bit. <coughs> Is that it right down there at the bottom? That's it. I haven't asked the dad about the phone, but he dad did say he came over and checked the pulses. Beyond that, I don't know what else he may have done. He did have a shotgun with him, and I have secured that in my vehicle. Yeah, but Shots out of that window too. Do we see a shell? At least three of shells. Got it. Right to the left of the screen, there appears to be. Uh, what does that appear to be? To the very left of the screen. There is some dog crates over there. On top of one of the dog crates is actually a dead chicken. Say that again. I'm sorry. A, a dead chicken. On the far left hand side of the screen. Did you, uh, Your Honor, with your permission, did you step down to the screen to point what you're talking about to the jury? You may. It's difficult to see, but right here on top of that small dog crate was a, what appeared to be a dead chicken. I'm sure I could do that, I couldn't see it. Could you do that? Do it again, please? This area right here. Is that that your light's on right there? That's correct. That's when I was really noticing the chicken.
just, just so you know, I've got at least five holes in the window in the back of that shed where rounds were exiting out the back that way. Which is going to be what we got because of the M1 number. He was carrying a shotgun on the guy. It is currently in my vehicle. Yeah. All right. May proceed. Thank you, Ron. That I state will publish at this time, Ron. Let me ask you a few other questions that I could. Uh, Deputy, uh, excuse me, Sergeant Green. I'm going to show you what's been marked as exhibit uh, number five to your testimony and see if you recognize this image. Yes, sir. That would be an image from my body camera when I was looking at the tire tracks in the grass. <coughs> Your Honor, this time I would move to admit State's Exhibit 5, I believe, without objection. Any objection to State's Exhibit no, number no, 5? It's admitted without objection. Yeah, I'll show you, Your Honor. Yes. <coughs> any exhibit that has been admitted. Thank you, Your Honor. All right, it doesn't show up on the screen that great, but that, who is that person in the image right there? That would be Mr. Murdoch. All right, and then just kind of in this area, it's more clear on the video, but that would be the, charge, the tire yeah. tracks you described earlier? Yes, where I'm shining my flashlight at that point is where the tire tracks were. We, uh, we cut the video off after playing sort of the relevant parts, but what did you do uh, for the remainder of this scene as, as the evening continued? Uh, so my, the remaining part of, of my role would have just been making sure the crime scene stayed secure, people stayed out of where they weren't supposed to be. Um, investigators were handling the remainder of the investigation. Uh, did eventually uh, anyone from the SLED, the State Law Enforcement Division, show up? They did. I, I don't believe that would have been captured on my body camera, but they did, yes. At some point, did you uh, like to turn your body camera off? I did. I cleared it with my supervisor, Captain Krause, to ensure that I would not be needed for any additional investigative purposes, talking to Mr. Murdaugh, or handling any additional evidence. And once that was okayed, I turned it off. And so that was consistent with uh, standard police procedures and practices and when to turn the body camera off? That's correct. You just didn't decide to do it willy-nilly or anything? That's correct. Okay. Um, at what point, uh, just roughly, do you remember, did you clear the scene or leave the scene? Uh, I don't think I left the scene until several hours later. Uh, were you still there when the sled crime scene arrived? Yes. Did you remain the entire time they, they were there, or did you leave uh, at some point? I would have left uh, prior to the end of my shift. Uh, I couldn't tell you the exact time that it was, but uh, I, they were multiple units, including sled and Carlton County investigators, still on scene when I left. <clears throat> uh, that's all the questions after this witness, Your Honor. Cross examination. Yeah, it's going to take me a minute to set up the 
set up some of the audio visual stuff. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll take a break at this time. Please go to the jury room. Please do not discuss the case.
Please be seated. You may bring the jury. You may proceed. They sent you to the wrong one. I don't know. But you've spent an extensive amount of time talking to Mr. Waters about your testimony, have you not? I've spoken with him a few times, yes. How many times? Three or four, maybe at least. And has he reviewed with you the points he was trying to make? We've discussed the body camera footage extensively. Right. Let me, let me go to a specific uh, piece of video. Um, and I apologize, Your Honor, the AV situation requires me to have my AV guy come and work on it, work from there. Um, have you got that list? So, as he's preparing this, you indicated you were asked by Mr. Waters that there was water on the ground, right? It had been raining and you saw water. Right? That's correct. Um, and as I understand it, and we're going to look at the video in just a minute, that water was primarily, <clears throat> at least what we see in your video, um, on the concrete area around the dog pens, correct? That's what it appeared, yes. Okay. And um, let's, let's go to that first question. Comment from Chair Couch. Comment from Chair He stays in the house. Okay. But if you had hunting dogs, 
and you had this uh, line of how many pens do you think there were? I, I, could, I honestly couldn't tell you. I mean, there's a lot. Eight, nine, ten? Sure. And uh, are you familiar with the concept of washing a pen out after a dog defecates in the pen? I've never personally done it, but I'm sure that's what you would do to clean out a pen. Okay. And in the pen, I mean, there's water inside the pens and outside the pens, correct? That's what it looks like. Okay. Go ahead. Video needs to be stopped for counsel to ask this question and for the witness to respond. You're uh, posing a question while playing a video. I'm sorry, Aaron. Or making a statement while playing the video. I'm sorry, the technology again is beyond my experience. Okay, so again, this shows the same area, shows water on the concrete outside these dog pens, correct? Yes. Okay. Go to the next one, please. So again, this shows, and actually there's a light shining and you see a couple dogs. So those pens are occupied by dogs. There's water outside the pen and inside the pen as if somebody had attempted to wash something out of the pen, correct? There is water both inside and outside of the pen, yes. So um, let's, let's proceed on, let's see if I can clarify a couple matters. Um, let's talk about this shotgun. You, this is the shotgun that Mr. Murdoch was carrying or had leaning up a car against the car when you got there, is that correct? It was leaning up against that vehicle, yes. Okay. And according to what you testified to just a moment ago, um, these are the shells, um, in the chain of custody on the sh shotgun and the shell, they went together? Whenever I released the shotgun to the sled agent who took possession of it, I was unaware of any shells that may have been inside of it at the time that it was handed over. That was what was discovered inside the gun, is my understanding. Okay, where's that chain of evidence? Okay, would you publish this to the jury, please? You would like me to read it? Yes, please. The Camo Benelli Super Black Eagle 3 12 gauge shotgun, serial number U573210 E17, one unfired shot shell 12 gauge Federal, one unfired shot shell Winchester 16 gauge. Okay, so there's a 12 gauge shell and a 16 gauge shell. Yes. 12 gauge shotgun. Yes. It's maybe way beyond your experience, but can you fire a 16 gauge shotgun shell from a 12 gauge shotgun? I wouldn't recommend trying it. You recommend what? I would not recommend trying it. I don't know that it would actually work or not. Could it result in 
damage to the person trying to fire the shotgun? More than likely. Uh, Jackson's already said he doesn't have an answer to that. Objections overruled. So you would not rather, you, you can actually harm yourself. It could blow up if you pull the trigger on a 16 gauge and a 12 gauge shotgun. I've never tried it nor seen it tried, so I don't, I don't and know. And the reason you don't do that is because you could have harm, personal harm from doing it, right? It's possible. So um, this shotgun, according to the chain of evidence you just read, had a 16 gauge and a 12 gauge in it. Correct. Um, and was leaning up against a car. It was, the shotgun was. Now, I'm sort of interested as to, sure. um, I'm sort of interested as to why, um, well, let me just cut to the chase on this. There's discussions on this tape, or maybe other, that there was a theory that Paul had shot his mother and then shot himself. Is that correct? That's uh, out on the scene. Yes. Because she, uh, she had been shot multiple times. Um, and he had been shot with a shotgun, at least one of the shots, uh, we all believe was upward, and that's why his brains were all over the ceiling. That part, I don't know. I I'm, I'm wasn't involved in that part of it. At the scene. I did not discuss anything being shot upward. I don't recall saying that. Did you d hear discussions to that of your fellow officers? Of a shot being fired upward? Yeah. That's what it looked like they were saying, yes. Okay. And further, um, I think y'all in front of you, one of the officers saying that brains are on the ceiling, there's blood all over the place, correct? I don't recall them saying brain was upward. I, I don't recall. Okay. And um, further, you, um, as you're discussing this with them, um, indicate, let me make sure I get this correct. Um, <clears throat> You indicate there are multiple, or someone indicates to you, there are multiple blackout rounds around Maggie's body in, in the vicinity, correct? Not rounds, but shell casings. All right, shell casings. Now, let me ask you this. When you got there, didn't the uh, fire chief and the fire department arrive before you did? No, sir. I was first on scene. Okay. Did they arrive while you were there? The one of the fire rescue workers, I believe it was Barry McCoy. And when you when you got there, we hear unidentified person, and, and in your notes you indicate it was the fire chief, I believe, that indicated to you, um, pointed out to you tire tracks, and you went over and looked at those tire tracks, and there were multiple tire tracks coming and going. Correct. I don't know that someone indicated them to me. I believe I just saw them. Okay. And um, what did you do to preserve those? The tire tracks? Yeah. Nothing. Um, and you certainly are not an expert in tire tracks. I'm not. So you couldn't tell whether it was multiple vehicles or one vehicle? No. And it may have been multiple vehicles? May have been. Did you take pictures of the track? I did not take any pictures of the scene. Did you instruct anyone to take pictures of the track? No, sir, that's not my job. When Sled arrived, did you tell them about the track? No, sir, not my job. You regret not doing that. It's not part of my job description. So what your job to even tell them there were multiple tire tracks? If it had come up, if I had been asked, yes. And in addition to that, since they were not secured in any way, multiple vehicles, law enforcement vehicles and others, drove over those tracks. That's possible. I wasn't over there the whole time to know what kind of vehicles were driving in the area. Well, by the time SLED got there, did you, you uh, strike that? You never took sled over and pointed out tire tracks. Not to my recollection, I did not. Was there somebody there at this, in, with your department that should have done that? I have no idea what they do with their job descriptions as far as what they point out to additional investigators. Did somebody from Fire and Rescue point out footprints? I believe on my body camera there is a fire rescue individual pointing out some footprints. Okay. Did you take pictures of those? I did not. Did you tell sled about them? I did not. So nobody attempted to determine whether those were Maggie's footprints, Paul's footprints, or at least that night, there was no effort by you or your department to preserve those? By me? No, I cannot speak for everyone else. Okay. And um, let me... Uh,
ask you this. How about go to um, 4439, please? And watch, let's watch uh, 10, at least 10, if not 15 seconds of that. Your Honor, I, I'd object. They're uh, playing, putting a transcript that's no, not no, been. No, 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 we're going to play the video. It's up on the screen. It's up on the screen, Your Honor. I'd object. I apologize. Can you take it down, please? Thank you. We have to prepare a transcript to sync with the video. Okay, well, I, I object to that. Your Honor, I object. This transcript's not been provided. There's no need for a transcript. The, the officer is here. They can play the video and he can comment. The transcript being offered. You have questions for the witness, questions for your IT guy. You're just reading, ready to proceed. I understand. I'm, we're waiting for you. Okay. <clears throat> yep. Rather than having to play this, let me just cut to the chase. It's taking too much time. Um, on this transfer, on this uh, tape, um, fire rescue person says to you, I believe you agreed with me, set of prints behind the trailer. Um, you were told there's. Jackie's publishing again this transcript. I'm not publishing, I'm asking. Right. Did you. I object. I haven't heard a question yet. I'd like to make one. Were you told by fire and rescue there's a set of prints behind the trailer? Yes. Okay. And um, did he tell you that they attempted to not disturb those footprints in any way? I don't recall exactly okay. what was said. 
Let me further ask you, you asked Mr. Murdoch, we heard this on the tape, he talked about the tire tracks coming and going, and he told you those weren't his tire tracks, correct? He did say that they were not. Okay. And um, further, he indicated to you, Mr. Murdoch did, that he felt this was related to the boat case, and you indicated you knew about the boat case, you read about the boat case. That's correct. And in the boat case, Paul had been charged with three counts of felony BUI, killing a young girl and wounding two others, correct? I don't, I don't know much details about that case. I really don't. Okay. But Mr. Murdoch indicated to you that the threats made against Paul. He did. And um, that he even got in a fight once about it. I believe he said punched. Punched, okay. Um, and so it, it, on the scene, he believed that Paul's death was connected to someone angry about the boat case, correct? Object to that, Your Honor, as to what he believed. Asking what? the witness what another person <coughs> believed. Object is overruled. Thank you. On the scene, Mr. Murdoch indicated to you he thought the death of his son was related to his son's involvement in the death of a young lady and the injury of two others in the boat case, correct? It appeared that that's what he was getting at, yes. Yeah. Um, and um, that's on the, tra on, the uh, on the tape. Now, let's talk a little bit about preservation of the crime scene. What did you do other than put yellow tape up to preserve the crime scene? That is about the extent of my job is to put up the tape and make sure people that don't need to cross it don't cross it. Um, and I noticed <coughs> that um, there were officers walking around putting little pieces of tape near shell casings. There was one officer doing that, yes. And in the process of doing that, at, I didn't see any lights other than maybe a flashlight. Were there any, did y'all put up any sort of high intensity lights so people could make sure they weren't stepping on something in the dark? At that point, there was no light, no additional lighting that had been put up. No. But you and your officers were walking through that entire area, is that correct? We were walking in the area, yes. Okay, and did you actually, um, Walk, I mean, the feed room, and, and um, let me, um, maybe this is the best way to do this. Holly, <coughs> pictures, please. I'd like to use the Elmo. I'm going to use the Elmo uh, in just a moment to show this witness. I'm going to offer these into evidence without objection by the state, as I understand it. Once they're marked, I have no objection. I wouldn't know they're graphic and they need to be shielded from view. Elmo ready? They can be marked. 
<coughs> what would the exhibit numbers be for the defense? Defense one and two are admitted without objection. Be a picture of Paul, and the second one, which would be Exhibit Number Two, picture of Maggie. And when you say picture of Paul and picture of Maggie, these are crime scene photos, correct? They appear to be yes. Is this what you saw that night? Yes. Both of these pictures. Yes. Accurately depict what you saw that night. Yes. So as you look at this, I'm, I want to make sure I understand. Um, one of Paul's feet is still inside. This is the feed room behind him, correct? Yes. And um, this is his head, lots of blood, and this would be a part of his brain lying next to him, correct? I don't know if that's part of his brain or not. So it's fair to say you didn't know whether that was part of his brain. When you first saw him, you didn't know whether his injuries were catastrophic and he was dead. Or did you? It was very clear that it was catastrophic. Okay. That's great. Um, now, um, when, when um, you came upon the scene, clearly this feed room was part of the crime scene, correct? Yes. Now, um, you're taught to keep the crime scene pristine, correct? As pristine as possible, yes. Don't, there was no reason for you to go in there, was there? Me at the time, no. Okay. Was there any reason for the police, uh, before the slave crime folks showed up, was there any reason for you all to go in there? There was no reason for me to go in there. I cannot speak if there was a reason for another officer to have gone in there. Well, let me ask you this. Did you all have any sort of crime scene expert um, at, with you that night, someone that processes crime scenes? Uh, investigators do process crime scenes. Okay. Um, do you remember going in that paper? I don't remember if I did specifically or but not. But you shouldn't have if you did, correct? It's not to say that I shouldn't have. If there was something that needed to be done in there, then yes. I guess what I'm getting at is, I think one of the, and you would agree with me, one of the cardinal rules of a crime scene is keep it pristine. Don't walk over things. Try to preserve tire tracks. Get pictures of them. Footprints. All those sorts of things. Was somebody on, with the officers with you, were you in charge of the scene? I was in charge of the deputies that were under my immediate supervision until someone higher than me arrived on scene. And were, were those deputies directed by you or anyone to do something to preserve the tire tracks? pictures, cordon them off, cover them up? I did not give anyone that instruction, no. So you didn't do that. Um, in terms of Paul, where Paul was laying, um, with, was anybody instructed, you know, put a cordon around him, there's no reason to go into the feed room, there's no reason to do anything obtrusive until 
a, a, the sled crime scene process. And they're on the way at this point, right? I believe they were, yes. And so if Okay, so let's put the other one up. And identify this for me, please. That's Maggie Myrtle. Your Honor, may we approach your group? Can you identify this for the jury, please? That picture? Yeah. It's Maggie Murdo. After she's been killed. That's correct. Um, and by the way, when you saw her um, from, I mean, was it apparent that she was deceased? You believe, I mean, but you, have you ever seen a dead body before? I have seen multiple, yes. Many, right. Yes. So you're sort of an expert in this area, who's dead, who's not, mm -hmm. who ought to get uh, EMS there to check them out or not, correct? You I've, make that call off. Yes. But you could understand, um, obviously, Alex Murdaugh's concern that they might be alive, that maybe, maybe, I mean, you're not saying that he shouldn't be concerned if somebody check out both Maggie and Paul to make sure, make sure they were dead, right? He was very concerned about that, yes. Okay. Now, as to um, Maggie Murdaugh, we see these numbers. Did y'all do these numbers, or were they done after y'all were there? I don't know when those numbers were done. They were not placed by myself. Or your team. I can't say that for sure, certain. We, we see that in the video. That they're putting down yellow uh, tape. They're not putting these down, correct? That's correct. Now, you also, according to the video we saw, um, a number of your officers are walking around um, marking where cartridges are, right? They were. Did they pick, pick any of them up? No, not to my knowledge. Well, later on, we see them talking to you and others on the video where they're saying they, these rounds came from a blackout. They were blackout rounds. For blackout. 300 blackout, yes, sir. Right. I mean, did they get down on their hands and knees and look? Or, I mean, did they pick you would have to ask them. I don't know what they did to know that they were 300 blackout rounds. Well, who, would, who, would, who are those officers that were running? walking around her without a light on, um, perhaps stepping on evidence, correct? Who were those officers? Deputy McDowell and Deputy Pruitt were both in that area. Were they doing that pursuant to your instruction? They were not specifically instructed to do it. They were just took the initiative to do it.
little dance over there. Next one, 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 one. Okay, so this is um, your officer is putting a sheet on um, Paul's body. Not putting a sheet on. The sheet was already there. Already there. Okay, continue, please. So people just want to fire rescue might have some more sheets we can steal. That's why I shouldn't be in by the law enforcement. There it is. It's more important. Who's that standing inside the feed room? Just inside that doorway was yeah. Deputy McDowell. Okay. Were you the president? Oh, that's your body cam, so you're watching him do it, right? That's, that's correct. Should he have done that? Stand where he's standing? Standing inside the feed room. It's part of the crime scene. We're all standing inside of the crime scene. Inside what? The crime scene. We are all standing in the same crime scene. I understand the same crime scene, but clearly you believe, based on discussion, and everyone in your unit believed, that the fatal shot was made where he basically standing, correct? That, in that area. Where we are all standing. Yes. Yes, sir. Is that procedure to walk around on top of an area where shots have been fired? It perhaps, and I think even in this, they're talking about tissue or brain matter laying there. Um, I mean, aren't you supposed to? You don't put anything on your feet. No, I'm, I'm saying, uh, is there a question? There's not a question in that statement. Let's sustain. You must pose questions. Did you in any way have your men or women? put protective gear on their feet. I saw you put gloves on, but did they, did they put anything to insulate themselves from contaminating the scene? On their feet, no. Um, in many instances, um, departments around the country have people dress in a gown to keep their DNA, their hair from contaminating the scene. Did you do that? We do not on road patrol with Gallatin County as as standard practice, no. You do not do that? Not a standard practice, no. Have you ever done that? I have not. Have you ever had something covering your feet when you're walking on a crime scene? I couldn't tell you that for sure. Now, if we later on find, and did you notice bloody footprints? Well, first of all, did you notice bloody footprints inside the feed room? I don't remember seeing any. Sorry? I don't remember seeing any bloody footprints. Okay. If there were bloody footprints in the feed room, could they have been created by you or your men? <coughs> they could have been created by anyone walking in that area, sure. And you're walking in there, or your men are walking in there, correct? Yeah, correct. And you think that's, that's standard operating procedure? Well, you do your best not to contaminate anything. Ooh. And this is your best? What you're looking at right now is standard procedure. To walk? in an area where there's blood, where there's brain matter, where there's, and I believe there was wadding laying on the floor? I don't recall. But you would agree with me that you have these procedures so that you don't contaminate the crime scene, so that you don't destroy evidence like those tire tracks or those footprints or leave your DNA or in some way alter the scene so that if I mean you would agree with me so that let me finish the question so that if there is exculpatory or inculpatory evidence that would help you find the perpetrator and prosecutor or evidence that would clear somebody that was destroyed some of that was destroyed that night because you your department and maybe even sweat didn't preserve that evidence isn't that correct I'm not sure if I fully understand your question. The question is this, if you are, if you are exfol exfoliating, you're, you're, you're standing, your men are standing in the spot, um, and there was evidence there, or the tire tracks that weren't preserved, <coughs> or the footprints that weren't preserved, it, that evidence could either incriminate somebody or exculpate somebody, could, correct? Could, yes. That's why you don't do this, right? That's why you don't contaminate the evidence, correct.
Uh, we put it around the whole area. Did you put it so that folks couldn't drive in and out? They were not to go past where my vehicle was parked. I believe that was the extent of the yellow tape. Yeah, but between your vehicle and the entrance, there was none of those, none of those tire tracks were preserved. Entrance of? The property. That if somebody had driven into the property. You mean from the main road of Moselle? From the main road. All, all the vehicles were coming in on that driveway. Right. So if somebody had come in and left, who had committed the murders, whatever tire tracks that were left were obliterated by your men. Is that right? It's possible. Were you there when the coroner arrived? Given my extent of the time there, I would assume so, but I don't remember but you specifically. you don't remember seeing the coroner? The coroner. I may have. I, I don't remember specifically. Apparently, according to the body cam, you didn't talk to him. Not on my body camera, but it could have been after the body camera was turned off. I don't know. And why did you turn it off? Why was the body camera turned off? Yeah. Once my job, my specific job of doing any primary investigation after my initial arrival is completed and I'm not going to be doing anything further to investigate, I, it's no longer needed. Thank you, Your Honor. May it please the court. Uh, you were asked a series of questions about contaminating evidence. Are you aware that any evidence was contaminated in this case? I'm not. Did you engage in everything you could to avoid contaminating evidence? Yes. Did you, in fact, instruct your deputies, set up a crime scene, and instruct them to avoid areas where evidence might be contaminated? We did everything we possibly could to avoid contaminating evidence. Did your officers all have basic training in trying to avoid contamination of evidence? Yes. Are you also, though, as first responders in, in a fluid situation, doing the best you can to assess what's going on? Correct. It's not your job to do the actual crime scene investigation work, is that correct? Not at all. Um, you were asked about whether or not uh, you'd had any meetings with prosecutors. Is it common for uh, law enforcement witnesses or any witnesses to meet with the prosecutors prior to a trial? Very common. Okay. Was it, did anybody ask you to do anything but express your accurate and honest opinions and uh, observations about uh, what you observed at this scene? No. You were asked about uh, this particular shotgun right here. This 12 gauge shotgun. This is the shotgun that Alan Murdoch had when you arrived at the scene. Is that correct? That's correct. And you were asked about the shells right here. Is that correct? That's correct. Did you unload this weapon? I did not. Was it unloaded by somebody else after you turned it over to them? Yes. You were asked a little bit about the 300 blackout casings or cases that were at the scene. Is that correct? That's correct. All right. And just real quick, explain to the jury what a casing or a case is, please. So a casing would be what would be left after the projectile has been fired through a weapon. After it had been fired. The shell that comes out of the gun and lands on the ground near the victim. Is that That's correct? Cor That's correct. So it's the remnants of a fired round. Is that right? That's correct. Mm -hmm. There were multiple ones of those blackouts surrounding Maggie. Is that correct? That is correct. You were asked a lot about the tire tracks, and you just happened to notice those over behind the, the defendant's vehicle. Is that correct? That's correct. And we had a still image put into evidence, exhibit number five. This is it right here, which is just a still image. Is that right? Yes. All right. And the still image doesn't reflect as good as what the video does. Is that right? You can see it The video shows it much better. Much better. All right. Were these like tracks in the dirt, or were these just impressions in the grass, in the dewy grass? They appear to be impressions on the dewy, dry, okay. dewy grass. They weren't like tracks in the dirt that you saw, correct? No. All right. I'm going to go back to the video. I'm playing it at approximately... 25 minutes and 11 seconds. Maybe. Okay. From earlier, but okay. only two were mine. Did you go out this way at all? No. Hell, it's right. Let's go over to that corner of the building. Let me see what uh, 
or we have first on whether or not we can all handle that part or not. I see some, uh, quite a few tire tracks in here. Were any of these you going in and out? Uh, no, I came in here and I left one time and I came back. Okay. <clears throat> Of them, maybe okay. from earlier, but okay. only two are mine. Did you go out this way? So the, the images that we just saw, those were the dewy impressions in the grass that you were just talking about. Is that correct? That's correct. And the defendant said two of them were mine, and the rest of them may have been from earlier. Is that correct? Yes. You were asked a little bit about the boat case. Did you have any detailed knowledge or understanding of the boat case when you arrived at the scene? No. You just knew very generally that there were some boat cases, is that right? Yes, it had been in the news. Did you even realize that this was that Paul Murdoch when you arrived on the scene? Not until he had brought up the boat incident. And who brought up the boat incident? Mr. Murdoch did. And within a few minutes of you arriving, he's the one that brought up the boat incident, is that he did. correct? He and did. he offered that right out of the gate as a possible explanation for what happened here, is that right? Yes. Nothing further, Your Honor. Anything further? Yeah, Your Honor. Um, did you find it unreasonable for him to say that his son, who'd been involved in this incident, who'd been threatened uh, on numerous <clears throat> occasions, been punched? Um, he told he'd been punched, right? He did. Okay. Um, that was a possible um, explanation not implausible for somebody killing Paul. You didn't bite back on him, did you? No. And it was, in his mind, apparently the only reasonable explanation that occurred, right? I don't know what was in his well, mind. Well, I mean, that's what he told you. That's what he believed. That was the statement that he made, yes. Okay. And just one other follow-up question. You were asked if there was any evidence, uh, the Dewey tire tracks, um, this was at 10 o'clock at night. Was there dew on the ground already? It was pretty humid out. There was a lot it of It was dew. humid? Yeah. It wasn't in, like in the morning? This was not morning time. So, um, but, but, and are you telling me no one could have looked, no expert could have looked and said, you know, that's a Suburban, that's a pickup truck, that's, no one could do that? Or, or do I'm you, not going to pretend to know what an expert in that kind of stuff can and can't do. But you were, you're not an expert. Did you? believe those tire tracks would last until sled got there? Yes, it appeared that they probably would. Did you point them out to sled? Did I do it? Did you point them out to sled? I did not. You may step down. I'll call your next witness. Thank you, Your Honor. The state calls Corporal McDowell. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you give to the court in this trial shall be the truth, so help you God? I do. Thank you. If you'll have a seat and adjust that microphone, make sure you speak into that microphone. State your name and spell your last name, please. My name is Chad McDowell. The last name is spelled M-C-D-O-W-E-L-L. -L. Corporal McDowell, how are you doing today? Good. Tell the jury uh, where you work, please. I work for College and County Sheriff's Office. As right. a, I'm assigned to the road patrol as a canine handler. Okay, and can you just give us a quick background of who you are, where you grew up, and how you ended up in your career in law enforcement? Sure. Um, I grew up in Colleton County, went to Collin County High School, went to college at Tri-County Technical College, where I studied criminal justice. Um, once I reached age, I came home, was hired by Collin County Sheriff's Office, uh, left for a couple of years to go work for Jasper County, and then came back to Colleton. I've been assigned to road patrol at Colleton. All right. And when, what year did you first start working for Colleton County Sheriff's Department or began your law enforcement career? 2016. All right. And uh, what's your current, you said you're a corporal now, is that correct? Yes, sir. 
Uh, and what is your current assignment? What, what are your duties? I'm still assigned to Road Patrol. I'm a canine handler. All right, and you say canine. Explain to the jury what that is. So I have a canine that is assigned to me. Um, we respond to certain calls or if we're requested by another deputy for narcotics searches, searches for suspects, things of that matter. All right, and canine is a dog, correct? That's correct. All right, what's your dog's name? Eva. Eva? What kind of dog is Eva? He's a Belgian Malinois. Malinois? Yep. Is that kind of like a German Shepherd? Kind of short kind haired, of? pointy ears. I got you. Short hair, pointy ears. Right. Uh, is is uh, Evo typically with you when you're out on patrol? Yes, sir. Uh, was Evo with you uh, the night of June 7th, 2021? Yes, sir. Uh, were you a corporal then at that time? No, sir. I was a deputy. All right. And uh, who, who was on the squad that you were on? Uh, Sergeant Daniel Green, Corporal Elise Janicki, myself, and Deputy Pruitt, Cody Pruitt. Right. And so who was your immediate supervisor? Um, it would have been. Corporal Janicki. Okay. And then above that is Sergeant, Sergeant Green. All right. And then above that? Lieutenant Nettles. All right. And then above that? Uh, Captain Krauss. Okay. Right. Um, what shift were you? Were you working the night of June 7th, 2021? Yes, sir. I was. And that was in Collison County? Yes, sir. And uh, what shift were you working that night? Night shift. Did you ultimately respond to a call for service at 4147 Moselle Road? Yes, sir. And you actually went there? I did. And did you come to the incident location at the kennels at that property at 4147 Moselle Road? I did. Is that in Colleton County? It is. Um, were you, uh, when you arrived, what other first responders were on scene to your recollection? Sergeant Green was there. Um, there was one other fire rescue personnel vehicle in there. I believe the rest were staged, the best I can remember. When I say staged, I mean at the head of the driveway. They may have, may have been, there may have been a couple of other apparatuses on scene. And which, uh, do you recall which driveway you entered? Did you enter the driveway near the kennels? Where you came from the Yes, kennels? sir. It was the same driveway everyone else entered. So you were parked behind uh, Sergeant, Sergeant Green's? Green. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, what did you do after that, after you got out of your vehicle? What did you do? Um, I approached the crime scene. I was trying to make my way to Sergeant Green to see what he needed me to do. I made my way through the crime scene as carefully as I could. I approached Sergeant Green, um, saw that he was interviewing the only person on scene. So I went back to my vehicle. Okay. And did you see who he was interviewing? Uh, Mr. Murdoch, yes, sir. Do you see him in the courtroom here today? Yes, sir. Can you point him out? Yes, sir. He's in the middle, navy blue suit. Your Honor, can the record reflect that he's identified the defendant? It does. I'm going to uh, show you um, what's been marked as Exhibit 6 to your testimony. No objection. And this is a disc, but I want you to take a look at it and see if you recognize this disc. Yes, sir, I do. All right, and what is on this disc? It would be body cam footage from my body cam that I wore. All right, and how do you know that this is that, that body cam footage? It has my initials on it. All right, so you reviewed this and put your initials on it, is that correct? Yes, sir. If I could get input, please. Let me ask you this. Um, when you got this call for service, were you currently on another uh, call for service or are you just out on patrol? No, sir. I was just out on patrol. Once you got that call for service, what did you do? Did you uh, activate your lights and sirens? activated lights and sirens and responded to the incident location. And once you do that, do you uh, make all haste to get to that incident location as, as fast, but it also as reasonably safe as you can? Yes, sir. Is that standard operating procedure? Yes, sir. Uh, 
first 10 minutes, sorry. The first 10 minutes of this body cam are essentially you driving to the scene, is that correct, roughly? Yes, sir. I'm gonna fast forward to closer in time when you arrive. proceed to the route what was that I had a GPS activated on my phone just just like most people use is that right yes sir okay kennels that you saw when you arrived at the uh, property yes sir and to the right is sort of the shed or the hangar is that correct that's correct <laughs> let me ask you this you're obviously serving as a road patrol officer, is that correct? Yes, sir. Do you, uh, what is your job as a road patrol officer as a first responder when you come upon a scene like this? What is your particular role as you arrive at something like this? Um, we go on scene, we secure the scene, meaning make sure there's no active threat for other arriving first responders. We'll preserve the scene to the best of our ability and then turn the scene over to arriving detectives. When you arrive at a scene like this, are you constantly not only paying attention for any threat or anything like that, but also making sure that you don't disturb or, or uh, um, any, any sort of evidence that may be uh, at the scene? Yes, sir. Is that part of your general training and standard operating procedure? It is. You also have to uh, couple that, though, with the duties of a first responder, which is to get to that scene, to secure it, make sure there's no active threats, and get it under control. Is that correct? That's correct. So the duties of a first responder have both of those sort of balancing together. Is that right? Yes, sir. But are you constantly always looking around for evidence, not only to identify it, but also to assure that you don't disturb anything? Is that your general? Objection, opinion? Your Honor. Weeding. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, what is your general uh, training um, as a road officer as it relates to uh, coming upon a scene uh, and looking for evidence? Our number one duty would be safety. Number two, we're looking for evidence so as not to disturb it. Thank you. Right there to the right, what is that to the right of the screen? It would be Miss Myrtle's body. Who are those individuals right there? Sergeant Green and Mr. Myrtle. How you doing? What did the defendant say to you right there? He said, how are you doing? Did you know him? No, sir. How you doing? That's what he said? Yes, sir. What's her birthday? I'm okay. Um, 91568. Okay, and what's your son's first name? You said Paul? Paul Terry Murdoch. And what's his birthday? Um, four. What are they covering him up? I got some kids for us now. Here, I'll help them find stuff to grab it. Tell them they don't have to do that. They don't need to talk. <laughs> Hey, he's asked that if we don't have to disturb anything, not to. We've got a sled on the way. Yep. All right, what were you asking uh, Fire and Rescue to do at that point? Just to try to preserve it the best they could. If they didn't. Them, but what were you specifically asking them not to do? Cover the bodies if they didn't have to. Right. And what was their response, though? I couldn't make it out. I believe he said we're covering them for family responding. I couldn't make it out. Uh, 
he's asked that if we don't have to disturb anything, not to. We've got a sled on the way. Yep. You recall now? It, again, it sounds like he says we're going to cover him up because of the family being here. Okay. Does the family being here? That's what it sounds like. All right. Uh, yes, I agree. I told everybody else to take so they won't really to come down here. Thank you. Hey, Cody, I need a piece of that tape whenever you get done. What did you just ask Cody for? A piece of tape, a piece of crime was, scene tape. All right, and who was Cody? Uh, Deputy Pruitt. He was the one that you see there with the yellow crime scene tape. And why did you ask Deputy Pruitt for some crime scene tape? I had observed a shell casing on the ground. I wanted to mark it so that it didn't become disturbed. Your general duties as an officer, you observed something and you asked for some tape to mark it. Is that correct? Yes, sir. And that's what you were previously describing your role is. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Yeah, if y'all don't mind, just uh, mark them. Do what? Okay. I got a case in right here, so watch your step. That's what I'm That case in that you saw, did you recognize what kind of ammunition it was? Yes, sir. What kind of ammunition was it? 300 blackout casing. And how could you tell it was a 300 blackout casing? Just my own personal experience. I own a 300 blackout and I recognized it. You recognize the case from your own experience? Yes, sir. All right. Did you observe any dogs in the kennels? I did. Do you remember how many or where they were? I do not remember. More than one dog, though? I don't remember. They've got, they said they had several casings by her body, but this one will be a little bit harder to find later, so I want to mark it real fast. that casing were you careful not to disturb its location where it where you found it yes sir I placed the tape beside it and then placed the rock on top so that it wouldn't blow away why are there so many shell casings and only one What was that loud noise? It's just my windshield wipers. And why, why was it making that noise? They had removed all the moisture, I guess. I don't see anybody.
Can I see a couple more pieces? I found some more there. Back there. Hmm. Yeah, I'm trying to figure out why there's it's 300 blackout. I'm trying to figure out why there's so many shell casings, but only one gunshot went to the back of each head. Not my job to figure that out. I'm just curious. I, I only saw one more casing, but just in case I see more. He, Daniel put his car in there. So, no. This is, uh, I'll tell you about this in a minute. Uh, there's one there. There's blood over here. Shell cases, 300 blackout. Sheriff. Those cases that you were marking right there, did you at all disturb the location where you saw them? No, sir. Is it your job to be doing a crime scene collection for this case, or are you just doing that to assist those who will do that that will arrive at a later time? No, sir. I don't collect anything. I'm just marking it so that, so that they're not disturbed. Yeah, those will be easy to find. I was just marking a couple that were in the gravel. It might be harder to see at some point. Y'all familiar with this family? Uh, I wasn't until he told me. I'll fill you in later. I don't, I don't think there's going to be anything for me anybody to do here. What did you just say right there? I don't think there's going to be anything for me and Evo to do here. All right. What did you mean by that? There was no article search that needed to be conducted right then and there. Putting Evo on the ground could have caused more of a disturbance than just leaving him up. Because that? that's a... You said for Evo to do? Yeah, for me yes. and Evo. Please watch your door. Hey, watch this stuff. I'm going to uh, now show you a portion of what's been previously admitted to evidence as Exhibit 1.
for the record, I'm starting at, at 4227. Who's that to the right of the screen right there? That would be me. All right, and uh, what are you about to do? Step inside and assist CID with right. lifting that sheet. All right, and were you asked to do that? Yes, sir. And who asked you to do that? Captain Chapman. All right, and where's Captain Chapman in this image? In the middle. Right. And is he a senior officer to you? At that time. Okay. And I noticed before you moved, what did you do? Turned my light on. And why did you turn on your light? So that I could plainly see what was underneath me, where I was going. Did you uh, disturb any, any evidence or anything as you started to go into the feed room? No, sir. Were you careful to avoid doing that? Yes, sir. Did you kick any shell casings or waddings or anything like that when you went into the feed room? No, sir. Did you step on any bloody free footprints when you went into the feed room? No, sir. If you had seen something like that before you stepped in there, what would you have done? I would have stopped and notified the detective. Fire rescue might have some more sheets we can steal. Do you recall what, if anything, was uh, laying on Paul's rear end? His cell phone, or a cell phone. Is that it in this image right here? Yes, sir. did say he came over and checked the pulses. Beyond that, I don't know what else he came He did have a shotgun with him. I have secured that in my vehicle. you kind of jump out of the feed room just then? Yes, sir. Did you turn on your light before you did so? I believe so. Watch it again. <clears throat> Did you jump out when you left the feed room? Yes, sir. And why'd you jump out like that? Try not to disturb the body. It was easier to leap out than to try to step. Did you uh, enter the feed room at any point after that to your recollection? Not to my recollection. I'm gonna uh, show you what's been marked as defense exhibit number one and see if you recognize this particular image. Yes, sir. I'll switch inputs, please. Does that appear to, is that how you found Paul when you arrived at the scene? Yes, sir. And were his hands underneath him in that fashion when you arrived at the scene? Yes, sir. Exhibit 7, 
and see if you recognize that image. Yes, sir. And what is that? It's a still image of video of my body-worn camera. Is that a still image of when the, doc, when the defendant said, how you doing, and walked up? Yes, sir. Cross examination. Please report, Your Honor. So, when you got to the scene, who was your supervisor? Can you repeat that question? I couldn't hear you. I'm sorry. But that's okay. I'll speak a little bit louder. When you got to the scene, who was your supervisor? Sergeant Green. Sergeant Green. And I believe Sergeant Green was instructing you all to put some yellow tape up. You did some of that? No, sir. You didn't do uh, any of that? Deputy okay. Pruitt, yes, but I didn't well, know. What was, what was uh, Sergeant Green, what, what was his instructions to you? What, what, was you? what were you there to do? Number one, let me withdraw that question. Were you there to apprehend somebody? Not at the time, no, sir. I was just there to assist where needed. Assist doing what? Whatever was needed of me. Um, were you invested? Were you all attempting to determine what happened? We were. We there as initial responders were there to secure the scene. Okay, secure the scene, and secure the scene for further processing by sled. By our investigators, I I learned later on that sled was responding as well. So let me, by way of example, um, you went down to where Paul's body was. It was covered with a sheet. We see that on the video. Correct? Not when I initially responded, but yes, sir. No, no, but the video we just saw. Yes, sir. And why Why were you all, why, I mean, what was the, was there a purpose of going down there and pulling the sheet back, looking around it? I believe they were looking for another weapon. What kind of weapon? I believe they were looking for a 300 blackout. But, I mean, we saw in the picture that you looked, at Paul's body, there's no 300 blackout laying next to him. Correct? No, sir. I'm correct. Yes, you are correct. No, there was no 300 blackout laying beside him. Okay, so you say you're down there looking for another weapon. Where were you looking for another weapon? I wasn't, sir. I was assisting lifting the sheet for detectives. And you can see you stepped into the feed room. Yes, sir. And based on the way Paul was laying, um, and of course you did have a flashlight and you were looking, trying not to step on anything. Did you have anything to insulate your feet? And in some jurisdictions, they have little baggy things to put over their feet to make sure they don't contaminate the scene. Did you have those on? No, sir. Um, and did you, uh, when you stepped in, you got a flashlight, what you were looking at with the visible eye you're determining you weren't disturbing the scene, correct? That's correct. You made an effort not to. Yes, sir. You don't know whether you did or you didn't. To my knowledge, I did not. But you can't say that you did. To your knowledge. I, can you repeat that? To your knowledge, you didn't. To my knowledge, I did not disturb anything. Okay. But you would concede there's microscopic evidence sometimes of crime scenes, correct? Yes, sir. That's possible. And you didn't have a microscope? No, sir. But the, like the SWED crime team would look very closely, would they not? They would not, I mean, as far as I could tell, you were looking basically for three or four feet away from the floor, right? Yes, sir. Okay. So what you can see with the naked eye at night with a flashlight from three or four feet is what you base your opinion you didn't disturb anything. That's correct. Now, and you don't know why they were looking for another weapon, but you don't know what, the, what other weapon, you don't know where that weapon might have been. And uh, again, multiple deputies had seen Paul's body before 
he was covered with a sheet, right? Myself, Sergeant Green did. Okay. Were y'all, in, in your presence, uh, <coughs> any of uh, the other officers with, with you there that night, did any of them discuss this as a possible murder, suicide, murder, suicide? It's possible. It's not to my recollection. Okay. Now, when you were going out and we saw you mark a shell casing, was that in the grass or on the on the um, on the, uh, the, the the dirt road? I believe the first one was in gravel. In the gravel, I'm sorry. Yes, sir. Okay, but you found others, right? Yes, sir. And to do that, you had to walk around in the grass. Yes, sir. Okay. And again, you've got a flashlight. You're looking, um, and uh, you don't know what was in the grass that you may have disturbed around those shell cases? No, sir. You don't know? No, sir. You may have disturbed something. It's possible. And I guess what I'm trying to ask is, why then were you trying to look for shell cases? Why couldn't you wait till the next morning? Why, why was this urgency? I mean, was somebody getting away? Or I, mean, I don't quite understand why. I can't answer that. I don't know. I didn't know if somebody was getting away or not. Did somebody instruct you to go find Shell cases? No, sir. You just did it on your own initiative? Yes, sir. And you concede that you may have disturbed or destroy evidence in that process? Microscopic or something I didn't see. Well, microscopic, something down in the grass. I mean, you're walking on grass, right? Not a, yes, not sir. A smooth surface like in the, in the shed, in the, in the uh, feed, feed room, but it's grass at night, correct? Yes, sir. And I guess what I'm trying to wonder is what y'all were doing. Were you trying to solve a crime? Were you trying to um, just index everything was there? And, and um, when did you find out SLED was coming? So we're trying to mark everything there. As you can tell, there were multiple units going back and forth, fire rescue as well as sheriff's office. We try to mark it so that it brings awareness to, their, to them and it doesn't become disturbed. I'm sorry, I can't understand you. I can't hear you. There were multiple units on scene, right. sheriff's office as well as fire rescue. Right. The reason that I saw urgency to mark those shell casings is so that it brings awareness to those of us that were walking around and they don't become disturbed. Well, that brings up the question, should you have been walking around? What do you, what, what if you got two dead people, whoever the perpetrator was, um, at that point y'all hadn't identified, had you? No, sir. Okay, so the perpetrator may be in the woods across the across the street as far as you know at that point, right? Could have been anywhere. Right. So you're not trying to solve a crime, you're processing a scene? I'm not processing anything. You don't know what you're doing? I just told you what I was doing, sir. You're marking pieces of evidence? Yes, sir. And the urgency to do that was so that no one else would walk over? Yes, sir. While you're walking around? around yes sir well you don't know whether you actually stepped on one or not do you I was very careful not to okay now let me also ask you this that the the pattern of the first shell casing was how far away from the feed room I, I can't say you found the first shell casing I found yeah I'm not sure 10 feet 20 feet more than me or further than probably about the same distance from me to you Okay. From the feed room door? Yes, sir. Now, um, I understand, a, and you fired, you got a blackout, right? Yes, sir. And when you fire that, does it eject to the right or the left? To the right. Mine does. Okay. So, if the feed room is where I am, that shell casing ejected to the right, right and forward, right and back? What do you know? Are you asking where the shell casing was in relation to? The door. It would have been forward and right of the door. Forward and right of the door. And there was a, the pattern of casings leading, did they all lead to her body? I can't remember. Did you sketch where you found them? No, sir. I did not do a crime scene sketch. Have you ever done a crime scene set, sketch? No, sir. Tell me your training in crime scene processing. It's very basic limits of what you would get at the Criminal Justice Academy. Very basic. Yes, sir. So you're not a crime scene processor. 
again, I, and I'm not asking this question repetitively, I'm just trying to puzzle it out. What, um, you don't know what your role was there. I was a first responder. Well, they were dead, Paul and Maggie, right? You couldn't render them any aid. Your Honor, I would object. Uh, no question in that statement. Is there a question? Could you have rendered them aid? Were they in a, in a physical condition where your assistance would have helped? No, sir. They were dead. Correct? Are you asking? Yes, sir. Yes. Okay, let me show you a couple of these, um, these clips and ask about them here. And I've got times. So we don't have to go through the... And then we breathe. Would you go to 1st responder? Yes, sir. Your first job is safety, correct? Yes, sir. Second job is, is to protect the scene, is that correct? Objection weeding. <clears throat> Tell me what your jobs as a first responder are again. Yes, sir. We secure the scene, make sure there's no current threat for additional first responders. We then secure the scene, make sure that nobody comes in that's not supposed to, so that we preserve any evidence that's there. As part of your training to 
avoid disturbing the scene as best you can. Yes, sir. Still paying attention to your primary role. Yes, sir. As part of your training and your experience and what you try to do is if you do see Objection, evidence. Objection, Your Honor. Leading. I'll rephrase, Your Honor. If you are on scene and you do see evidence while you were there, what is your standard operating uh, procedure in that event? I would mark it. And why do you do that? Just to bring awareness to it so that it's not disturbed. Is your job to be a crime scene investigator? No, sir. You're just marking that? I'll rephrase. <clears throat> you were asked earlier about apprehending any suspects. Was Mr. Murdoch ever in custody? No, sir, not to my recollection. To your observation, was he allowed to move freely? Yes, sir. Was he allowed to interact with people who came to talk to him? Yes, sir. Was he ever placed in the back of a police car? Not that I'm aware of. Never put in handcuffs? No, sir. Was he being treated as a suspect when you were there? Not that I'm aware of. Nothing further, Your Honor. Nothing further, Your Honor. Thank you. You may step down. Lights back up. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, we'll break for lunch. We will resume at 2.15. Please do not discuss the case. In recess till 2.15.
Please be seated. Anything before the jury comes? Just uh, very quickly, Your Honor, in conversation with uh, Mr. Harpootley, and uh, as you're aware, one of the uh, areas of, um, that the state intends to go into at some point, uh, subject to Your Honor's ruling, uh, would be the events of what we call the side of the road, and that was the uh, Salkahatchee Road events in September of 2021. Uh, we, of course, have talked with the defense and don't plan to go into that, as we've discussed with Your Honor, until uh, you know um, they've had a chance to make whatever motions and Your Honor has had a chance to rule. Uh, there may be sled witnesses or other witnesses as we go forward um, that not only participated in the murder investigation, but also the side of the road investigation. And in discussion with Mr. Harpudlian, he's agreed that we can call those witnesses to discuss only the murder with the ability, with Your Honor's permission, to recall them later for the side of the road in as much as Your Honor uh, rules any of that uh, relevant and admissible. And I just wanted to put that agreement on the record, Your Honor. Mr. Harpudlian? That's our agreement. I mean, right. Your, Your Honor, only, only one for the caveat. If he would make it clear when he calls the witness so that I don't inadvertently stumble into an area we don't want to just if you just designate for lim for lim if you just say for limited purposes that'll key me to stay away from asking questions that might result in me opening the door in the other into the other area certainly and any such witness will be instructed what the subject matter is for that examination prior to it okay you yes may, sir. you may bring the jury All right, thank you. Your next witness. Tanish Bryson Smith. You come up here, please. First name Tanish, last name Bryson Smith, B R Y S O N hyphen S M I T H. Good afternoon, Ms. Bryson Smith. Good afternoon. Um, could you tell the jury where you work? Hampton County E911. And how long have you worked for um, Hampton County E911? 17 years. And what um, is E911? Um, Emergency Services Dispatch Center. And what do you do there? Um, currently, I am in a director position, just instated in December. Um, I am over the management of day-to-day -day operations of the 911 Dispatch Center for Hampton County, including um, budgeting, payroll, um, like I said, day-to-day -day operations, and um, record keeping, recordings, et cetera. Okay. Um, does the um, Hampton County 911 keep records um, in the normal course of business? We do. And um, what kind of recordings are these? Um, we have audio recordings from 911 phone calls, administrative line phone calls, as well as video recordings from our um, radios from the field. 
Are all 911 calls recorded? They are. And how are these calls stored? They're stored on our um, NextLog data recording systems. How long are they stored for? Uh, as long as we need them. And who has access to those records? I do. Um, does anybody else? No, ma'am. Just you? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And how do you access the records? Um, there is a database in my office that I have to log into to access any recordings that is requested. Okay. All right. Um, sometimes do calls from um, another county, such as Colleton County, um, come into Hampton County? They do. And um, why does that happen? Cell phones pick up on the nearest PSAP based upon the location of that cell phone at the time of call. PSAP mm -hmm. meaning public safety answering system. Okay. And and why does it pick up on that on the location and send it to Hampton as opposed to Colleton? Due to the geographical location of a locate of a phone call or a phone when that call is made, mm -hmm. that cell phone picks up at that tower. And the tower wherever the nearest PSAP is. Mm -hmm. is where that cell phone will be routed to. And what do you do when um, you and Hampton County receive a call <coughs> from Collin that's supposed to be going to Collin County? We transfer that call out to Collin County. Okay. All right. Um, back on June 7th of um, 2021, um, did you receive a call from Alec Murdoch? We did. And that call came in to Hampton County, is that correct? That's correct. And um, what did happen to that call when um, it came in? Once it was determined that the call was located, the location of the emergency was Colleton County, we transferred that call out to Colleton County. And you determined the Colleton County location how? Based upon the numerics and the address that was given. Once we plug that information into our system, it populates in Colleton County. The record reflect. I'm showing the witness takes what's marked this takes exhibit nine. This exhibit nine is admitted without objection. Um, State's exhibit nine is a disc. Um, can you tell us what is on that disc? Um, the initial 911 call that came in on the night in question. And how do you know that call is on that disc? I was able to listen to it and I dated it and initialed on the 23rd of January. Your Honor, at this time the state would move exhibit nine into evidence. Already been admitted without, without objection. Mr. 
Moselle Road. I've been up to it now. It's bad. And, uh, How did they shoot? Did they shoot themselves? Oh, no. Hell no. <laughs> okay, and are they breathing? No, ma'am. Okay, and they said it's your wife and your son? My wife and my son. The state has no further questions for this witness. By the defense. Cross examination. Hampton County. Hampton County. Correct. And um, how, when you dial 911, does it, how does it determine what county to send it to? When you dial 911, the cell phone company picks up that it's a 911 call being placed. They hit the dearest cell phone tower, and based upon the location of that cell phone tower, is routed to the dearest PSAP, or public safety answering system. Okay, so the nearest cell phone count, uh, tower to Moselle would be? Was Walterboro Highway Tower. Um, and you're from Hampton? I am. Um, that's not you on the phone, is it? No, sir. Okay. Do you know the Murdoch's or do you know Alec Murdoch and his family? Not too much, yes. I mean, a little bit, but. Okay. Not. Thank you. Anything further? Stay on. You may step down. Thank you. Thank you. Call your next witness. Angela Stallings. If you affirm the testimony about to give the court shall be the truth, so help you God. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Take a seat. State your name again for the record. Angela Stallings, S-T-A-L-L-I-N-G-S. Hi, Captain Stallings. Good afternoon. Um, could you please tell the jury um, where you work? I work at the Culloden County Sheriff's Office. Okay. And how long have you worked there? I have approximately 15 years with the Sheriff's Office. Um, what are some of your um, duties and responsibilities at the Sheriff's Office? I am the Administrative Services Captain. I oversee the 911 Center. I'm over our Civil Process Division, Court Security, our School Resource Officers, our Sex Offender Registry Division, um, Training, Supply, and the Hiring Process, and Records. You have quite a lot of duties there. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> um, in the course of your duties, do you um keep records of 911 calls? We do. Okay. Um, can you explain to the jury um, what happens um, when a 911 call comes in to Colleton County? Yes, ma'am. So when a call comes into Colleton County, it hits our recorder system. As soon as the call connects to the recorder and starts ringing, our recorder automatically starts recording automatically. It starts recording before we even answer the phone. And is a recording of all 911 calls that come into um, Colleton County Center kept? Yes, ma'am, they are. And how are those um, records kept? They're kept on our um, server that is the Carolina recording software system that we use. Who um, has access to those records? Myself and one other employee. Um, is it normal for y'all to have calls routed from um, Hampton County to Colleton County? 
Yes, ma'am. Okay. And why, why does that happen? Depending on the location of the call within the county, um, we border several counties. Depending on if it's a cell phone that is calling 911, depending on the closest available cell tower, it will hit that tower. Wherever that tower is located, it routes to that PSAP. All right, on um, June 7th of 2021, um, did Colleton County receive a transferred 911 call from Hampton County? Yes, ma'am, we did. And what time did that call come in? May I look at my notes? Yes. That call came in at 2207.09, which is 10.07.09 p.m. And the notes you're referencing up there, is that some kind of report that's generated when the call comes in, or what are you looking at? Yes, ma'am. This is a report that's generated through our recorder software. Okay. So you received a call from 10.07 p.m.? Yes, ma'am. Who was that call from? Hampton County. Okay. And who was the caller? The caller was Alex Murdoch. Do you recognize Tate's Exhibit 11? Yes, ma'am, I do. What is it? It is a disc of the 911 call. Okay. And how do you know that? It has my initials and date that I reviewed it. And this is a true and accurate depiction of the 911 call made by Alec Murdoch? Yes, ma'am, it is. Your Honor, at this time I'd move Tate's Exhibit 11 into evidence. Okay, Your Honor. Submitted without objection. Thank you, Your Honor. Okay. 
Captain Stallings, there's a break between parts in this call. Why is that? The way our recorder system is set up, if there is a pause with either the call taker or the, or the caller not talking, the recorder automatically cuts off. As soon as it starts to hear someone talking, it automatically kicks back on and starts recording. Yeah. 
Thank you, Captain Stallings. The state has no further questions. Yes, ma'am. No All right, thank you. You may step down. <coughs> I'll call your next witness. We are firm that the testimony about to give the court shall be the truth, so help you God. I do. Thank you. Take a seat in the witness stand. State your name again for the record. Spell your last name. Barry McRoy, M-C-R-O-Y. Chief McRoy, could you please tell the jurors where you work? Work for Collin County Fire and Rescue. And what is your position? I'm, the, I'm the fire chief. The Fire Chief of Collin County Fire and Rescue? That is correct. And how long have you worked at Collin County Fire and Rescue? Uh, 29 years. And about how many scenes do you think you have responded to over the years? Oh, I have no idea. Many <laughs> thousand. <laughs> As, um, what are some of the um, training that you need to do um, to be a paramedic or uh, respond with fire and rescue? Well, that has changed greatly over the years, but presently, uh, to be a paramedic, you have to have been an EMT for, it, we recommend two years, which that's about a 
500 hour course and then you take a uh, paramedic course which is about 1500 hours uh, in Colleton County we require people to be cross trained so they have a 500 hour firefighter course as well and are you yourself a paramedic I am and how long have you been a paramedic since 1981 what are the would be the normal um, procedures when responding to um, a gunshot to treat gunshot wounds or to a shooting? Well, when initially respond, the uh, law enforcement that's responsible for that jurisdiction typically clears the scene to make sure that it's safe for the other responders. Uh, when we arrive, we want to evaluate the patients to make sure that you know, if they've got some injuries that we can treat, we treat them and uh, we transport them to the closest trauma center. So if someone has been shot, what would you normally um, do to initially treat that person? Oh, we would control their bleeding, protect their airway, uh, get them transported as quickly as possible. It may involve starting IVs. In Colton County, we carry blood, so we could administer blood to the patient if they required it. Okay. Did you respond to um, Moselle Road on June 7th of 2021? I did. And um, tell us about what you did when you got there. Uh, I was on my way home from work and uh, I heard the Sheriff's Department on their radio dispatch units to the uh, address in question and they advised that there was two people shot. Shortly thereafter they dispatched fire rescue units and we have a standard protocol of what they send. There were multiple patients so they dispatched two ambulances and put a helicopter on standby and then a supervisor is also dispatched. Uh, we also send the closest fire station, which in that case was the one from Islington. Uh, I responded from Walterboro, and uh, I did arrive uh, ahead of everybody else. Uh, dispatch had told us not to go onto the scene, so I staged about the 3900 block. And a few minutes later, a deputy passed me, and I went in behind the deputy, which was um, uh, Mr. Green that y'all listened to earlier. And what did you see when you were driving onto the scene? Uh, it was really dark. The um, had a long dirt driveway, and uh, when we arrived, there was uh, some kennels off to the left, and like a big barn with a th three-lane lean-to on the uh, right-hand side. I'm going to show you what's been marked. It takes exhibits 51, 49, 24, and 21. I'll just ask you to take a look at these pictures and tell me, um, are you familiar with, with those pictures? Uh, yes, ma'am. This does appear to be the accident scene. And these are um, true and accurate depictions of the um, crime scene that night? Yes, ma'am. <clears throat> Your Honor, this time I would move states 51, 49, 24, and 21 into evidence, with states exhibits 24 and 51 um, being sealed with the... Um, Agreed upon place holders. No objections. 
We admit it without objection. So, Chief McCoy, could you tell us um, how you observed the victims when you got to the scene? Uh, Deputy Green went through the scene first. Uh, he actually drove a little ways in between the uh, kennels and the lean-to. Uh, it was very dark, uh, so he needed his headlights to see what was going on there. There was uh, animals in the kennels. Uh, I don't know how many, but uh, there was also some chickens fluttering around on the uh, equipment on the right-hand side. Uh, the body of a younger uh, male subject was face down by the kennels. Uh, he had some very severe injuries to the head. And uh, there was a female subject at the end of the lean-to. Uh, she was also face down with severe injuries to her head. And there was a gentleman standing off uh, a little distance away from it. And uh, he was on a cell phone and seemed very upset. Did you recognize that gentleman? Uh, yes, ma'am. And who was that? Uh, Alex Murdoch. And how did you recognize him? Uh, I have met him in the past. Uh, on a professional basis because we have uh, had to do depositions and such with his law firm. Case Exhibit 21. Can you um, describe what the jury is looking at in this picture? On the left hand side of the uh, photograph is uh, the covered body of uh, Paul Murdoch. And the, uh, down towards the end of the lean-to, is you can see the uh, covered body of uh, Miss Maggie Murdoch. And those bodies appear to be covered with pink sheets? Yes, ma'am. Now, were those sheets there when you got there? No, ma'am. We got those off the ambulance and covered up the bodies. And why did you do that? Well, we typically do it to, uh, you know, to shield the uh, bodies from the view of the public. There were a lot of people showing up there. The family was on the scene. and. You know, People just really don't need to see that. State's Exhibit 24. Please describe what the jury's viewing. That is the uh, body of uh, Paul, and he is laying face down at the entrance to, uh, there's like a little utility room at the uh, kennels. Um, he is laying down with, you can see there's substantial damage to his head with a lot of blood around his head and what appeared to be his brain down there around his ankles. And this is how um, you found Paul? That is correct. Okay. And you said that appears to be his brain down there by his foot? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And um, at this point, would, did you check um, his pulse? I did not check his pulse. Uh, he and his mother had both had injuries that we consider incompatible with life. Uh, there was a lot of coagulation there where the blood had congealed and they were not currently ble bleeding, which would indicate they did not have a heartbeat. And obviously with his type of injuries, he, you know, it's not a, you know, any way you could sustain his life. And it's takes exhibit 51. Uh, that is uh, Miss Maggie. and. Uh, she also had severe injuries to her head. You can also see the congealed blood around the uh, bottom where her face is, and she had a, a hole in her head to where you could actually see inside of her head cavity. Was it necessary to um, check Mrs. Murdoch's pulse or perform any life-saving treatment? No, ma'am. And she, she also had injuries that were not sustainable. It takes a kid with 49. That's just where? That's the lean-to, and uh, that's Miss Maggie's body in front of the little side-by-side. Uh, -side. Mm -hmm. um, thank you. I have no further questions for uh, this witness at this time. Cross-examination. Just one moment.
chief of the Cobham County Fire and Rescue, correct? That is correct. And you, uh, in the past, have had dealings with Alec Murdoch in a professional capacity with his law firm, correct? That is correct. So you recognized him and you've seen him before, correct? Yes, sir. Uh, was his demeanor uh, grieving, distraught, upset? He seemed to be very upset, yes, sir. Very upset. Um, now, I've got just a very few questions for you. But when you responded, and I'm going to try to get the picture, I think. You recognize this from uh, the night of June seventh. That is correct. And those headlights facing us are those the headlights from uh, the suburban. That would be a vehicle that was south of the location, so the police car would have been north. Right, but um, is that Mr. Murdoch's vehicle, or do you know? I have no idea. Okay. So um, you, when you got there you indicated to to somebody that they needed to preserve some tire tracks correct that is correct over to the right hand side there was th there's three rows of, of i guess where they could park equipment underneath the uh, lean to and the farthest one over there was no equipment in it but there were some tire tracks coming out of it and i mean how did you come to see those did you drive you drove in off of moselle road correct i drove in off of moselle road the deputy parked in this little driveway here between the two the kennel and the lean-to right. i parked at the end of the um the lean-to uh, where i was at uh, i activated my scene lights which are all the way across the front of the light bar the scene lights the they're, they're high, high intensity lights high intensity road. bright white lights okay so it was very dark and uh I could see the um, the tire tracks over to the right. So as we look at this view, they're not visible in this picture. I, I understand that, okay. but would the area you were be to the to the right, this side or the other? Other side. side. Okay, over to this side. That is correct. And on the other side of the shed, right here. Um, more to the bottom. More to the bottom. To the okay. right. So let me, um, maybe we have a video of this that will be a little easier for you to look at. As you look at, stop it one second. No, I'll go back the other way. Okay, back it up a little bit. From this perspective, can you see that perspective right there? Yes, sir. The, uh, hold on. If you back up just a little bit. Back it up. Right, if you'll stop, stop it there. Go back. You can Stop. see the see the workshop on the left. How about do this? How about step down here for us? So we all are singing from the same sheet of music. If you'd stand over that way so these jurors can see. There's a workshop right here. Uh-huh. And there's a row here, uh -huh. a row here, a row here. This row is where the tire tracks were. And the crime scene is where? Right here is where this Maggie's body is and that's Paul's body. Okay. And how far is it from where you saw those tire tracks to where their bodies were approximately? 20 or 30 feet. 20 or 30 feet. And you saw, now this was gravel, 
grass, dirt. It's kind of sandy. But sandy, but distinct tire tracks. Yes, sir. Like one, one pair of tire tracks. One pair. Okay. Um, and you couldn't tell which direction they were going in, or I mean, you're not. Could have been coming in. Could have been going out. You're not a tire expert, are you? No, sir. Track. Okay. Go ahead and have a seat. Thank you. So. Whose attention did you bring that to? Uh, brought it to attention of one of the deputies. I don't recall which one. Was it was. Green? Uh, Deputy Green? I, I don't recall. But one of the Carlton County deputies? Yes, sir. And uh, you indicated to him that it needed to be preserved, needed to be roped off, needed what? I showed them to him and told him, when I said, hey, there's some tire tracks over there. Uh, we, we tried to block off the driveway. I had one of our units stay out on Moselle Road, but a lot of vehicles kept driving around them. There was uh, civilian vehicles kept coming in and then it began raining so at that point it so after you told he didn't put any yellow tape up to block it uh, no sir they uh, had yellow tape in front of our vehicles where we were parked but they did, didn't put any yellow tape down there and vehicles drove around your vehicle and just drove up and down that road yes sir. destroying the tire track well the ones that were on the road part not the ones under the shed okay <coughs> but to your your knowledge did, while you were there, did anybody take any pictures of those tire tracks? Uh, I have no idea, no sir. Okay. Did you see any other pieces of forensic evidence, if you will, while you were there, other than the tire tracks? Uh, there were shell casings around uh, Miss Maggie's body. Okay. Now, um, when did you go over and examine Paul's body? Yes, sir. Did you go in the feed room? No, sir. Um, were you very careful around the body? Yes, sir. And the uh, Sheriff's Department started putting up the yellow tape, and as they did that, that we backed up and got behind it. Thank you, Court's indulgence. Is this the area you were talking about where the retired truck? Uh, they're over to the left. I'm sorry? They're over to the left. Okay, but all these vehicles that are parked up there? That's the driveway coming in. Okay. And then you're saying after that is where these tire tracks were? Uh, yes, they're over to the left of this police car. You, you can see my vehicle was the red and white Tahoe. Right. Maybe 15 feet to the left of that was where the tire tracks were. And you pointed those out to the... Carlton County Sheriff's deputy said yes, they needed to be preserved. I just showed them to them. I didn't tell them what to do with them. Thank you. No further questions. Sir. Read that right. Well, thank you, sir. You may step thank down. Thank you, Your Honor. We'll call your next witness. State calls Jason Chapman. Thank you. Your final testimony about the other court shall be the truth, so help you God. I'll do, ma'am. Thank you. Thank Take you. a seat in the witness stand. State your name again for the record. Yes, ma'am. Spell your last name.
Good afternoon. My name is Jason Walker Chapman, last name C H A P M A N. Chapman, uh, J Jason, uh, the State Unit Director, thank you. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Where did you grow up and uh, what education did you, did you obtain? Sure, I'm a, a native, born in Walterboro. Uh, I've lived here most of my life. Graduated from what was Walterboro High School at the time. I attended the College of Charleston and the University of South Carolina, Salkahatchee, before starting my career in law enforcement. I actually joined the cadet program well before age of 21, uh, then became a reserve deputy, a dispatcher, and then a class one officer. And I've now been doing law enforcement. I'm in my uh, 26th year. 26 year career. Would you walk us through how you first got, when you first got into law enforcement and kind of the roles you've uh, taken on and the training you've, you've done in that? Certainly. In uh, 97, I attended a uh, reserve uh, officer class. It was a joint class between the College County Sheriff's Office and the Walter Pearl Police Department. I had to actually wait until I turned 21 to take the final exam, went down to the academy, took the exam, passed, began working as a reserve. I then got hired as a dispatcher at the Walter Pearl Police Department where I worked a short stint as a dispatcher to fill in a hole. And in the spring of 98, I attended the South Carolina Criminal Justice Academy I graduated later that year. Uh, I actually graduated as a distinguished graduate from the academy. Since then, I've been doing law enforcement. I did my first 16 years with the city of Walterboro, and I transferred over to the sheriff's office January 1 of 2013, where I have remained uh, since then. My training has, it, I've worked through pretty much every division there is in law enforcement, probably with the exception of civil process. Um, I have an extensive background in firearms. I'm a firearms instructor, uh, less than lethal instructor, uh, active shooter instructor. Uh, I've had uh, training as a narcotic supervisor. I've been through schools for administration, uh, pretty much everything. What's your current rank with the Sheriff's Department? Currently as captain. And uh, what, how would you describe your responsibilities uh, presently? So currently I oversee special operations that includes our investigative division, our tactical team, uh, search and rescue. Have you uh, ever had an opportunity to testify as an expert in, uh, in a trial? I have. Tell us about that. Uh, this past year in uh, 2022, I testified in federal court in Charleston, South Carolina on a case uh, involving the city of Beaufort and I was sworn in as a expert witness in general police procedures. Um, I'm gonna direct your attention back to the date of June 7, 2021. Are you familiar with that day? Yes, sir. <clears throat> what was your role with the Sheriff's Office back on that date? The same as it is currently. Supervising investigations? That's correct. Now would include, uh, would that include um, homicides? Yes, sir. All right, did you have an opportunity, to, were you dispatched or were you noticed of uh, an incident that occurred on that day? I was. I, was we, what, I actually heard the call and went in service before I was dispatched, but yes, sir. All right, what did you hear over the radio? Uh, call coming out that a transfer from Hampton County had been received in which the caller was reporting that his wife and child had been shot. <clears throat> did you know a location at that point? I was given the location by dispatch, but I was not familiar at the time of the dispatch as to the parties involved. And at that point, did you decide that you were going to go to the scene? I did, sir. Uh, what was the dispatch lo location? I believe it was, uh, I think it's 4142 Moselle Road in Islington. Uh, were you made aware of who this involved? At that I point? was not at the time. Is uh, 4147 Moselle Road within the, the uh, limits of Colleton County? It is, sir. And walk us through what you did that night upon, you know, learning of this incident and then uh, making your way out there. Walk us through that process, if you would. Yes, sir. I, uh, I had a brief conversation with uh, Sheriff Hill by telephone while en route. He had been advised of the uh, caller's identity as Mr. Alex Murdoch. 
um, with my career, I'm familiar with the Murdoch family and Mr. Murdoch, and uh, Sheriff Hill advised me that if it was in fact confirmed to be Mr. Murdoch, that he would likely uh, notify SLED simply because of the conflict of interest with the family. And uh, shortly before we arrived, uh, I believe he was able to confirm that, and that call was made uh, to request for assistance from SLED and to request that they actually assume primary in the investigation. Does your, um, does your department, the, I mean, the sheriff's office, do you all work uh, fairly closely with SLED? Is that a common thing? We do, sir. All right, describe that process. I mean, not, not including this particular investigation, but in general, how have you all worked with uh, SLED as a law enforcement agency? As far as crime scenes, uh, like response to crime scenes, uh, my division works well, the entire agency, but we work very well with SLED. Uh, the remote location, although we have a satellite office for SLED here in Colleton County, actually, for the Low Country, their crime scene unit still comes out of Columbia. So, middle of the night, when they're notified that we may need assistance, or in this case, that we wanted to take them to take primary in the investigation, even with the fact that they're emergency services, it's still going to be about an average of a two hour response for that crime scene unit once they're notified. So it's very common for us to begin the investigative process at that scene while we're waiting for their arrival um, with them working jointly with us. And that investigative process usually begins with the acquisition of a search warrant, which we know will be required once the crime scene team arrives on scene. And uh, that just comes from a long uh, supported tradition of us working well together and obviously being capable to do so. As a, uh, as a captain and as a supervisor of the investigations, do you typically wear a body-worn camera? I do have one. At that particular night, I did not have it. It's on my, uh, my exterior uh, ballistic vest, and the scene was secure prior to my arrival, which so I did not have my vest on. On arrival at the scene, were you made aware, or did you become aware of who who in your department had already arrived? I, I was listening to the radio so that I knew that several patrol units had arrived prior to myself. And I believe myself, the sheriff, and one other detective arrived probably about 10, 10 12, 13 minutes after the initial officers. Do you remember the rough appro approximate time that you arrived on scene? I want to say it was around uh, 10, 35, 10, 37 p.m. that evening. Um, I, walk us through what you observed upon arrival. Sure. Uh, so while en route, I, uh, I reminded the shift supervisor, uh, Sergeant Daniel Green, that to try to maintain the integrity of the scene as best as possible. I wasn't there, so I didn't know the magnitude of the scene. I don't know what he has, but just reminding him, limit personnel inside the scene, uh, do what we can to preserve. Uh, Sheriff Hill came across the radio. I was trying to pull the weather up in this particular area I was driving through. I did not have much phone signal, so he did, and realized that we had an approaching storm that was uh, about 45 minutes out. So he advised over the radio once he got his phone to pick it up that we needed to secure a tent. I had not been there yet. He was requesting the tent to place over the deceased bodies of the two victims. I relayed that information to one of my lieutenants that was en route. I also turned one of my detectives around that has the longest drive in, which is Detective Rutland, and I informed her to head to the office to start working on a search warrant. Is that your common practice? Yes, sir. Um, kind of you talk, you spoke before about you, you all conducted joint investigations <coughs> with SLED. <clears throat> is it common for, uh, well, describe for us what your roles might be in a joint investigation and what SLED's role might be and how that, you know, played out in this case. Certainly. So the very first thing, obviously, is a notification for request for assistance and then the explanation of what exactly we're, we're requesting. Uh, a lot of times our assistance is, the what's requested is nothing more than assistance with the crime scene. Sometimes it may be that we're asking for them to take the entire case. In this case, the notification was made by the sheriff 
All I was told was that SLED was responding, that they were sending a team of investigators as well as crime scene. Knowing that crime scene was en route, we went ahead and secured that search warrant. That's why Detective Rutland was turned around and sent directly to the office to go ahead and initiate that process. Obviously at uh, 1030 at night, we knew that we were gonna have to get the warrant typed and then we we're gonna have to locate a judge in the middle of the evening. We wanted to have all of that done prior to the arrival of the crime scene unit. And you touched on earlier a little bit about the weather, but describe the weather as it was when you arrived that evening. As I arrived, hot, sticky, uh, I recorded in my notes, it's the only way, reason I can go back and tell you exactly, but uh, what I have recorded in my notes is uh, 79 degrees, 89% humidity, hot, sticky. Uh, it was not raining yet, an occasional uh, raindrop on the windshield, but no actual rain yet. It was um, a little foggy on my ride in, but not foggy at the scene, and obviously evening hours. And I think you mentioned before, but rain did set in it. However, how, how long was it until the rain set? It wasn't very long. I think the, the radar was pretty accurate. I want to say within 45 minutes to an hour of that notification, the rain did come. And you mentioned setting up tents or requesting that tets, tents be set up. What would be the purpose of those tents? So in response to the crime scene, obviously preservation of any type of evidence is important. But the preservation is not always limited to, to leaving it there and taking a picture of it and wait for somebody else to get there. In this case, uh, Mother Nature wasn't complying. We knew that the rain was inbound. So the tent was placed over uh, victim Maggie's body in an attempt to preserve any evidence that may be there. I only had one at the time. Uh, Paul's body was positioned somewhat over an extending ledge that I was hopeful would keep some of the rain if it did start off of him. The other evidence would have been anything from, and at the time I didn't know what we were going to be facing, but from, you know, tire tread, footprints, uh, shell casings, anything at all. So the intent would be to preserve that as best as possible, and if it was going to be affected by the approaching weather, do the best thing we could to mark it out, measure it out, and have that done or partially done by the time crime scene arrived. As far as uh, safety purposes, when you arrived on the scene, would you have considered the scene to be secured at that point? I arrived pretty quick. I know that uh, as far as the immediate, you know, right there, uh, the area that I'm sure that you ladies and gentlemen have seen with the, the tape and the videos that were played earlier, the immediate scene. Yes, the outside, you know, the property's approximately like 1,700 acres, and it's not just that property. It sits in the middle of nowhere. At the time, you know, we did not know what we had. I don't know if we had a active shooter, didn't know if we had a murder-suicide, didn't know if we had people in the woods. We don't have any idea. So it, inner perimeter secure, I would say yes, sir. Um, outside, you know, in the woods, across the street, I wasn't sure yet. I didn't know. Um, is it fair to say that there was a lot of unknowns at that point when you An first arrived? A lot of unknowns when I first arrived. Very little known other than uh, at the time what they had gotten as initial information from Mr. Murdoch and the fact that we had two deceased. Um, tell the jury, if you will, well, first of all, let me ask you this. As part of uh, your law enforcement training throughout the years, have you had any experience with or, or training in, you know, life-saving techniques, if, if needed, if, if someone were needed CPR or something like that? Are you trained in it? Oh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. And arrival on the scene, did you uh, physically observe the two bodies that were present, both of Maggie and Paul? I did, sir. And in your estimation, was it... Was it clear to you that they were deceased? Yes, point? sir. Yes, sir. Did you consider that life-saving techniques would be would be possible or would have any result? I did not. Uh, paramedics were there shortly before me. Uh, got a great fire rescue. It, I was assured that if there had been anything that could have been done, it would have been initiated prior to my arrival. But from what I saw, it was uh, well beyond that. When, upon your arrival at the scene, were there anyone else present that were not either sheriff's office um, employees or um, employees of 
EMS and fire. Was there anyone else present on the scene? The two victims, Mr. Murdoch and emergency services. And you mentioned Mr. Murdoch, is, uh, yes, is that Alex Murdoch? Yes, sir. Is he present here today? Yes, sir, he's seated at the defense table, uh, blue blazer, white shirt and glasses. <clears throat> did you have an opportunity to observe Mr. Murdoch that night? I did, sir. As part of your responsibilities there, you were, what capacity were you there at the scene? In what capacity? Again, investigative. I, I realized that you know we had notified SLED to take over, but again, it, what we were what we were attempting to do and what we did do was identification uh, of any potential evidence. Um, we marked that potential evidence. If time had had uh, allowed, it would have been photographed, and then from that point, simply protected. Absolutely zero collection of anything was done by any of my staff, with the exception of one uh, GSR kit that was instructed by SLED. <clears throat> I know, uh, were you familiar, have you familiarized yourself with the body, body worn video of both Ms., uh, deputies Green and uh, McDowell? I did, sir. <clears throat> and what was your first order of business upon arrival, expect, you know, particularly relating to, to Paul? Uh, by the time I got there, they had placed a sheet over both of the victims. Uh, it's something that you know I'm not always, I, I don't like. Uh, I understand that um, a lot of times it's placed there, you know, so the family doesn't have to see that. But I prefer that it does not happen. But in this case, it is already there. And um, because the scene is still somewhat fluid, we talked about the inner perimeter being being secure, but. As reported by Mr. Murdoch, we don't know who the, de the defendants are. We don't know where the shooters are. We see shell casings scattered around the ground that are obviously rifle casings. Um, there's uh, some evidence to support that at least one or, or more shots into Paul were from a shotgun. That means two weapons. So were there two people? Are there other people that may be injured? Um, you know, so inner perimeter may be considered secure, outer perimeter not so much. So we began really quick with a, um, an inspection of the two individuals to make sure that we had not missed a weapon or that the initial responding officers had not missed one. And uh, we could see that Maggie- I wasn't until he told me. I apologize. We could see that Maggie, uh, there was nothing laying beside her. We looked closely, again, we didn't move her. So we went over to Paul and I had a couple of the deputies there and a detective lift the sheet just so that we could look and make sure there wasn't a weapon underneath him. His hands were tucked so you couldn't see underneath his body. Um, but as best we could tell from the present state of the body, unless there was a weapon directly underneath him, there was nothing out to left or right. <clears throat> Captain Chapman, I'm going to direct your focus to the uh, monitor in front of you. I'm going to play what's been marked as space exhibit. What's that? Oh, yeah, we need to need. It's exhibit number one. Yes, sir. Marked it to the 28 minute mark on that. Um, look, just looking at the still image right now, are you familiar with the scene there? And can you I describe am, what's going on? Yes, sir. So uh, that's myself, uh, Detective Tyndall, uh, Chief McRoy from the Colleton County Fire Rescue. Uh, Lieutenant Lonnie Nettles in the background near the perimeter, inner perimeter tape. And uh, victim Paul Murdoch's body to our left there in the open doorway to the feed room. What are you uh, preparing to, to do here? At this point in time, double checking to see if there is a weapon. Yeah, I told you before we weren't sure whether we we're talking about uh, a full murder, a murder-suicide, uh, active uh, shooter scenario. Are there other suspects that may be in the woods? Um, we knew we had the casings that matched to a rifle with some evidence to support a possibly a shotgun. So when asking uh, 
if any other weapons had been found, everyone stated no. So I had them lift the sheet to make sure there wasn't the barrel of a gun or anything sticking out underneath the body. A little bit about the scene here and your, your observations of what you're, what you're looking at. The uh, kennels uh, directly to the left, if I, if I could direct your attention to those. Yes, sir. Um, did you notice animals in those kennels? I believe in the one, two, three, there's a couple kennels closest to the feed room that did have dogs in them. I don't, and, I, and possibly one towards the end. They weren't all full, but the ones closest to the feed room, I think there was a dog in at least one or two of them. And was the area wet? The area directly in front of the feed room was like wet, wet. Um, there was also water that tailed out of at least the first two kennels. The rest of the sidewalk was not wet. This and that water, it, I never saw a hose, so I'm not sure if it was leaking from something, but it was actually standing water. And uh, was that water present consistent with the weather at the time? No, sir, it hadn't rained yet. Not, not enough to leave anything. It was a drizzle here and there. When you observed uh, the body of Paul, was it physically wet as well? For the, the clothing he, was he was saturated with uh, obviously blood and tissue. Um, and his clothes did appear to be wet, but almost as if like absorbed from the ground up, not saying that someone had sprayed him with a hose or anything. Please observe the video if you would, and I'll have a few questions afterwards. Hey, you want to close that in? Sir? Was that? You want to close it in? Yeah. So the guy, you know, you see the other guy, maybe whoever Eric is, or just a caller, there's a guy over here that's wanting to talk to him. Don't even know who Eric is. I know Alex over there. Alex. direct Deputy McDowell into the, the feed room area to help with lifting of the sheet? I did, sir. And why would, why would you do that? I want the sheet lifted directly up, not drug across the body. Again, I told you I'm not really a proponent of sheets, but it, since it was there, I would prefer that it be lifted straight up. Uh, I had already walked through to see uh, what if anything right there you can see i'm cautiously stepping there but i'd already checked to see if we were going to be able to step to the inside of it the uh spot right inside the uh inside of the door inside the door frame i had looked and i felt like he would be able to step straight in pick the sheet up put the sheet back down and step back out and is preservation of a scene important it is important in your line of work absolutely is uh, equally important uh, securing the scene and making sure that you understand if there's any loose firearms around or that there's any other it uh, is again controlled circumstances going on it is again you know the sole purpose of this right here is to help determine whether or not i have any uh suspects still on the move or if there's a weapon underneath him thank you 
Is this you looking for the, the gun? It is, sir. What do you notice about the body physically laid there, there at Paul's body? Uh, feet towards the feed room, head towards the uh, driveway, hands tucked underneath the body, fairly saturated in blood. Uh, majority of the head is gone. There's a lot of tissue, what appears to be at least some of the brain or, or, or most of the brain lying uh, on the opposite side from me to the victim. Uh, wet, again, I'm assuming probably from soaking up rain or water, whatever that is off the sidewalk. And a uh, uh, smartphone sitting on, propped up on the back of him. <clears throat> Was Paul's person saturated in, in, in physical matter and blood? Yes. And his hands, were they accessible to anyone without, could you have touched Paul's hands or wrists without physically moving him? I can't actually see his hands at this point in time. He fell down on top of him? Is that They're underneath saying? his body, yes, sir. <clears throat> what did you observe that was laying on, uh, laying on top of Paul's body right there? Again, it was a smartphone. Did you have a chance to examine that smartphone and get fairly close to it? I got close to it. I didn't pick it up. Um, I was present when it was actually collected later, but it was not collected at this point. And later on, it was collected. Uh, describe the collection process that occurred uh, after this. It, it was collected by myself and uh, Agent David Owens. I believe he's going to be your case agent. Uh, as far as collection of that, I stood by as a witness as he collected. Uh, he had on rubber gloves, it was picked up. He didn't actually do any manipulation of the device in front of me, it was bagged as evidence and placed in the vehicle. Was the phone physically bloody? I don't recall any blood or water on the phone. I'm not saying that microscopically there wasn't, but I don't recall from the naked eye seeing anything. That's, that's what I'm asking about. No, from sir. Your, from your observations, was it wet from either water or blood? No, sir. And when it was lifted off of Paul's um, shorts, did it leave like a mark of blood or water or anything like that? Not that I recall, no, sir. Dad did say he came over and checked the pulses. Beyond that, I don't know what else he made. He did have a shotgun with him. I have secured that in my vehicle. able to locate a firearm underneath the body of Paul? When the uh, coroner's office arrived and the crime scene unit and victim Paul was eventually moved, there was not a firearm underneath. Are you familiar with the rifle round called 300 Blackout? I am, sir. Is that a, uh, in your 26 years of experience, is that a caliber that you come across with any frequency? In the last couple of years, probably more than ever, but in all the crime scenes that I've worked, I believe this was at the time the second ever in my career that had a 300 blackout as far as being involved in a homicide. As supervisor on the scene, is it part of your responsibility and your duties to sort of direct what people do? You're the person in charge? It is, sir. 
does that free you up to do other things? If others, if you have your deputies doing the tasks that you've assigned them? If possible, yes, sir, sometimes. And on this particular instance and this night, were you able to, um, to observe Mr. Murdoch and see what he was up to? Oh, yes, sir, I, and I spoke to him on a few occasions. Whenever you're investigating a case, <clears throat> I'm going to ask you about items that, that you might designate as uh, points that you need to address. Yes, sir. Do you describe what that might mean? What, what, what's in general like an investigative point or investigative cue that you need to focus on? Anything that we hear or see that based on the limited amount of knowledge we have at that particular point just creates a unknown, something that may need further investigation, something that maybe doesn't necessarily correspond with the evidence on scene or with the statement made by somebody. Uh, it's, it's something that just we need to follow up on. It can't just be left alone or accepted as fact. What are some of the physical observations? I'm gonna ask you about physical observations of Mr. Murdoch. Did he appear to be, um, at least outwardly, did he appear to be upset? Yes, sir, he did. Did you, were you close enough to observe whether or not he actually cried or had tears in his eyes? He was upset, uh, definitely upset. I got up to him, again, like I said, I spoke to him on at least two different occasions and um, he was breathing hard. You know, his facial expressions were that of, uh, you know, torment, but it, did I physically see him crying? I did not, he was sweating, but he wasn't crying. What'd you observe about his clothing? Uh, clothing was uh, clean. Uh, didn't see anything that stuck out and uh, obviously no dirt or blood or anything that indicated he had been rolling around on the ground or that he had you know, been involved or anything up to that point. I'm going to ask you about something you do when you're arriving on a scene, particularly if it's a homicide. Do you have a practice of phoning or having a dispatch send you the 911 call? Yes, we do. Why would you do that? We get a lot of information um, from 911 calls, more so than uh, the average person I think would believe. And it's over the years, we've had several cases where had we not gone back and looked at that initial 911 call, we would have missed some very important information that, or information that could have cleared up some unknowns, those points of investigation you talked about a much sooner. So in our investigative process, that's now one of the things that we try to do relatively quickly. In this case, with the uh, scene being fluent and not knowing if we had suspects on the loose, I opted to go ahead and do that and it took a minute for them to get caught up as busy as they were, but they were able to get on the phone with me and play the uh, 911 call for me. So were you able to hear the 911 call? I was. And are you listening to that, that 911 call, uh, both for content, but also critically and, and trying to examine the things that are said? Oh, absolutely. We're listening for noises in the background, exactly what is said versus what we see, so forth. So with that awareness of everything that was said on the 911 call, do you then take that information and apply it to the scene? Yes, sir. And are you applying that information to try to see if it checks out, to see if things are consistent with what you heard on the 911 call? Yes, sir. And on the 911 call, did you did, did Mr. Murdoch indicate that he had tried to uh, examine the bodies or, or check their pulses? Uh, yes, he's, uh, I believe dispatch stated, don't, do not touch if you haven't and Mr. Murdoch replied that he had touched them, checking them. To check and see if they're breathing? And, and which would be expected, absolutely. <clears throat> Upon examination, Mr. Murdoch, did you have a chance to look at his hands? I, again, I did talk to him, yes, sir. Did you have a chance to look at his shirt? I did. And did you see any indication that there was any blood on, on any part of his body? No, sir. Not Physical. again. Just physically, with my observations, no microscope. There, I did not see any blood anywhere. And in your experience with viewing Paul's body, had you physically touched Paul, would there have been blood left on your hands? Yes, Your Honor. Speculation. Response. Is 
physically saw the body, and he cannot testify to the locations that would be touched and whether it would transfer. Does he know what location he touched? I'll let foundation. I'll ask a few more questions. Yes, sir. <clears throat> Mr. Chapman, going back to or Captain Chapman, going back to your experience in um, life-saving procedures, is there are there common areas that someone might touch to check the pulse if they were indicating their check breathing? Uh, uh, objection, Your Honor. The question is where did Mr. Murdoch touch the body for a pulse? Was it the neck? Objection. is overruled. The prosecutor is asking the question. Go ahead. Thank you, Your Honor. Is there a common areas that someone might check a body to check for, if they've indicated they're checking for breathing, are there common areas that someone might check? No, I believe the most common is the, the neck and the wrist that you see that, you know, people with limited training would probably use. I'm sure there are others for, with medical training. So the neck and the wrist. And please tell me where Paul's wrists were located when you discovered his body. Uh, they're up underneath his body. And was Paul's neck accessible? If his wrists were underneath his body, was, was his neck accessible? I think you can get the portions of his neck. Um, I don't know that you'd be able to get underneath. I mean, he's face down. And I didn't try to get a pulse, but where I know that you would check would be difficult without manip manipulating the body in some fashion, I guess. And if you had to manipulate the body, and if you were going to try to check his pulse via wrist or neck, with what you saw that night, would your hands be bloody? If I had attempted, they would have been, yes. you another investigative point that you observed that did, did Mr. Murdoch on the 911 call indicate he was going to retrieve a firearm? Yes sir and that actually came out while I was in route as a caution from the dispatcher but it was also present on the call when I monitored the call. Having listened to the phone call uh, having listened to the 911 tape what was your reaction or what was your um, what was the cue that you were you were fixated on as it relates to the retrieval of the firearm? What, what is going through your head at that point? Well, that he's scared. I mean, that he believes there may be somebody there that possibly whoever he believes hurt them may come back and hurt him. <clears throat> and, and sure, that, that's your estimation, right? That's what you're thinking was and going That's on. what I was thinking, yeah. I mean, and that's what I believe pretty much anybody would think if he was there present with them and got spooked and because I believe the the verbiage on the 911 is he states I'm going to get a, a gun that I don't feel safe, and dispatch tries to tell him we would rather you not, and, and he states again that I I'm not going to show it to the officers I'm not going to hurt anybody I'll put it away but I feel unsafe so I understand that. All right, listen to the 911 call critically. What then did you observe towards the end after retrieving a, a, a firearm that that you would cue on to? in your investigative um, process? After knowing that he had went and got the gun, knowing that he stated he, stated he was unsafe and that he went and got the firearm there, when he came back, as soon as he got back to the scene, the, the only thing I believe that was odd from that point was that he wanted to separate the call or cancel the call to call family prior to anyone's arrival. It was the only thing that just struck me as odd. Again, it's just a, a point of investigation. Up to that point in the phone call, he had asked repeatedly, where are they? Are y'all coming? Are y'all coming? Are y'all coming? I'm not safe. I'm going to go get a gun. And then when he got back to the scene, I, I, are y'all here yet? How far out are they? And then it was, I need to call my family. And the phone disconnected. <clears throat> and when we refer to the scene, the scene is obviously, is that does that uncover Part of what was, you know, fenced off with crime scene tape. Does that, you know, when referring to a scene? That would have been the primary scene, yes, sir. But in your mind, what what does the scene also entail? What other things? Well, I mean, the only thing that the phone could potentially extend that scene, or the phone calls, excuse me, could potentially extend that scene. As far as entering a crime scene and not being able to introduce evidence or ex exiting a crime scene without being able to take away ev evidence. And by his own admission, he left the scene, went to his house, and got a gun. Potentially, that could make the house an extension of the crime scene. Because that's what he indicated on the phone call. And that's what he indicated. 
does uh, is Mr. Murdoch considered part of that scene? The scene, of course. Uh, he, he's inside that area when we arrive, and I mean, he would be factored into everything. And th would that justify or explain why you might pay particular attention to him? Sure. I mean, we would anybody that was there. Now you've, uh, and I'm asking you this again. I know you've answered, but you've had a chance to review the body worn camera from both um, Deputy Green and uh, McDowell, correct? Yes, sir. <clears throat> Did your, uh, after those videos cease uh, recording because the, the crime scene had been secured, did you have an opportunity then to continue your investigation and continue your line of work? We did. And those, uh, these activities would not have been captured on the video because it had been shut off. Is that correct? That's correct. Did you have an opportunity to physically observe, meaning watch Mr. Murdoch? while your deputies and your, your, your officers were performing their tasks. I did. <clears throat> what were a couple of the things that you noticed that stuck out to you when uh, physically observing Mr. Murdoch and how he was either behaving or what he was doing? Again, I mean, he was emotional. Uh, distress on his face. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't see him cry. Not everyone cries. I don't have an issue with that. Um, there were times that uh, when we got to certain places or, or asked certain questions that you could see a slight demeanor change or body language shift. And you know, I took note of that, but again, as, just as a point of investigation, but uh, he remained at the scene. He wasn't forced to say he was cooperative, but he did, you know, there were times that you could see reaction to different things. Okay. Did you notice a reaction? Did you ever notice him tracking your your movements or your officer's movements? I know when I was there when um, I ordered Detective Arnado to take a GSR kit and explain that how the kit worked and why we were taking it. And he was very cooperative with giving the kit, and we really didn't have an issue there. Um, later, was looking at some. I wouldn't call them tire tracks, I'd call them tire impressions because there's no dirt there, it's just grass, but we noticed there was quite a bit of uh, tire impressions that ran around the back side of the hangar. And we'll get to the tire tracks in a second. Um, you mentioned a term just, just a second ago called GSR. Yes, sir. Um, if you wouldn't mind, could you explain to us just sure. what that I'll is? for that. So a gunshot <laughs> residue kit is just a kit. Uh, we use specific kits provided by SLED uh, because they're the kits are then sent off for testing, but it's meant to uh, test for the presence of gunshot residue. They're uh, very non-invasive. They have little ampules. You open up a sterile kit, put a set of gloves on, open the kit up, and you'll dab one of the sterile uh, collectors around on the front and back of the hand of an individual, package those up, tape it off, seal it, date it, time it, uh, case number and then that's eventually sent off to SLED. We were asked, I spoke earlier and said the only thing that my detectives physically collected prior to SLED's crime scene's arrival was that GSR kit. It was done by us because there is a time limit on those and um, you can't always wait. I know everybody sometimes thinks it's, well, why don't we just wait and do all this tomorrow, but GSR has a six hour limit on it. So we had to collect that that night and we did so. And that's what I was referring to when I say GSR is a gunshot residue test kit. And uh, Captain Chapman, related to the, the GSR retrieval, I know you mentioned that, that time limit, the expiring time limit. Is it your understanding that that time, what's the, does it, that time limit refer to humans or just things in general, objects in general? That refers to when we collect uh, us a GSR sample from an individual. That is our restriction from the SLED lab is that it has to be collected within six hours of the estimated time of firing the weapon. And again, that kit's, I mean, it's just as much uh, for any type of exculpatory as it is conviction. It, we use it a lot of times to exonerate someone uh, as much as we would to convict. Going back to um, Mr. Murdoch's observations that you had, 
did he appear to fixate on one body or the other that were there? Especially watching the camera footage, um, I didn't notice quite as much in person, but later scrutinizing the body cam footage, there's, that does, he does appear to fixate more on his son than his wife, but that's in that limited amount of body cam footage that I have. All right, you mentioned before the tire tracks that, that you observed. Yes, sir, or tire impressions. Tire impressions, yes, okay. Sir. Let's set the scene, set the scene for us if you would. Sure. Please, um, describing the grass, and we've heard a lot about, you know, there's rain, but moisture. Describe the, the scene, if you would, on, on that grass. So if you come into the property and you go down the dirt road with Paul on your left, as you see in the picture before y'all, uh, that gravel or dirt road between the kennels and the, what's referred to as the airport, or the airplane hangar, eventually ends in grass, a large grass area that separates that hangar from a, another shed. And in that area is where uh, Mr. Murdoch's Suburban was parked with the flashers and the headlights, and the headlights were pointed towards Paul's body. But that entire area there is grass as opposed to the dirt or gravel lane between the two structures. And there's some very obvious at that time impressions in the grass, but they're not tracks like you think of that you, we could cast a track out of dirt, um, but you can't cast an impression that's in laid over wet grass from the dew. I mean, you're not gonna be able to do anything with that other than to document it. And I did notice them. And I actually asked Mr. Murdoch to, if he could tell me, cause I didn't, was unaware of the body cam footage at the time. Could you tell me what direction you came from? And he told me that he pointed and said he had come from the residence and pulled up here, turned around and went back the same route, confirming that the tracks around his vehicle, the Suburban, were his and he said there should be two sets from where I arrived the first time left and went my got the gun and came back and I asked about the other sets that you could see and there was one in particular that appeared to come close to Maggie's body possibly uh, you had to have the light just right and it just happened to be that I noticed it looking at the the ground in front of Mr. Murdoch's vehicle because the lights were shining on Paul that you could see that so the tire tracks, um, did you and uh, Detective Rutland spend some time trying to, or attempting to identify where those tracks could have come from? We did try to follow them. Uh, one thing that started to bother me was that we didn't have a vehicle. We were trying to figure out how uh, Maggie and Paul got to the, to the kennels. It's a pretty substantial distance from the residence to the kennels. Uh, uh, the property, you know, and I don't know an exact, but I'm guessing, you know, probably a thousand yards from the kennels to the house. And it's 10 o'clock at night, so I, what, I don't know what time they got there, but it's a pretty long walk, especially if you're planning on walking back in the dark. And did they drive a vehicle? Did they drive uh, you know, a four wheeler or a UTV or whatever, a golf cart? But we see Mr. Uh, Murdoch's vehicle, and because he left it as instructed where it was. But we were trying to determine if any of these other tracks lined up with the position of any other vehicles that were on the property. There was a UTV with a flat tire. There was another um, a half-ton pickup in the shed across the grass portion from the hangar. Mm -hmm. I was thinking maybe those tracks would line up, or the impressions that were in the grass would line up with that vehicle. Did they appear to line up with those not. vehicles? They did not. As part of uh, your investigation, on flash forward and just a, just a little bit, did you um, operate and, and, and record two drone videos of the property? I did. And I'm, hand, I'm gonna hand, show you a... I'm gonna hand you what's been marked as State's Exhibit 187 and 188. Briefly take a look at those two videos, uh, DVDs, if you would, and let me know if you recognize them. Because for both of these discs, I have marked as having previously viewed and confirmed their authenticity, one on the 25th of this month and one on the 26th of this month. And these would be the drone video recordings? Yes, sir. 
Thank you. Uh, Your Honor, we would move to uh, admit these into evidence, I believe, without objection. Any objection? I know, Your Honor. Yeah, admit without objection. And ladies and gentlemen, we'll take a recess at this time. Please do not discuss it.
You may bring the jury. All right, thank you. You may proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, Chaplain, resuming our, our testimony, I'm going to show you a handful of pictures. I'm going to mark. I've marked and I'm identifying. I ask you to please identify them. No objection. You offer them all into evidence? I am. Uh, they are admitted without objection. Okay, permission to publish? Yes. established that the drone footage has been placed into evidence and I would request permission to play that first and then I'll go to the pictures. Sorry. Uh, Captain Chapman, as we were discussing earlier, um, you did record, describe, or describe the process of uh, what you did with the drones and uh, why you would have surveilled the area. Took pictures with our drone just to give an overall. Some of the agents have different uh, job descriptions that day. Some of my personnel had di different job descriptions that day. In order to have something as a reference point to go back and work with later, we took the department issued drone and took a couple area aerial videos so that we could use them for reference later. And your honor request permission for the witness to sort of direct the uh, geography of the uh, yes. drone footage. If you would please step down. Sure. And if you could identify for the jurors as the video is played what we're, what we're actually looking at. I appreciate it. And, uh, and the trees would be the main driveway that comes out. All right. <clears throat> if you could identify that on the video, the, the driveway that you're referring to. Sure you walk up. Yes, sir. So this would be the main structure and the main driveway that comes out from it with the trees. Ladies and gentlemen, the main structure, a residential structure, and the driveway, the main driveway that comes away from it with the trees. All right. And now looking down the road a bit, uh, Captain Chapman. This road that veers to the left or turns left, what is that road? So that would have been the route that was described by Mr. Murdoch as how he left his residence and came to the dog kennels, coming up the road with the planted trees, making a left here, ladies and gentlemen, there. And if you play the video a little farther, that road ends at the incident location with the dog kennels. And if you would, please describe for us what we're actually looking at with this dog kennel area, um, identifying the structures uh, and the um, entry point for the, the road, the, the main mailbox area. 
Absolutely. So this would be the area coming from the main residence. When we arrived on scene that night, or when at least when I arrived, right here, positioned with the headlights facing down this way, would have been Mr. Murdoch's vehicle. You keep hearing reference of the airplane hangar or the main shed. That would have been the large structure here. The dog kennels are the smaller one you see in the background that run perpendicular. And the driveway goes out to the road. Do I need to show you ladies and gentlemen here? Does everyone please, able to please see? Please do. I just go sure. through what these structures are. So again, the roadway coming from the main residence. Here you have what's been referred to as the hangar. Mr. Murdoch's vehicle was parked in this general area here with the headlight shining down this direction. This would have been the dog kennels. This is the large grass area that we were referring to when we're talking about the tire impressions in the dew. And this is a separate structure that sits off to the side. And where would the uh, entry point for the uh, Moselle Road be on this uh, distill shot? Following straight down between the hangar and the dog kennels, going all the way through the tree line, the Moselle Road entrance would be back here. All right, I'm going to just play it one time without stopping. <coughs> All right, thank you, yes, Captain Chapman. I'm going to play the second drone video. If you would, please, um, please tell us what we're looking at from this perspective right now. Yes, sir. So this would be the back portion of the airplane hangar, the driveway, the vehicles at the bottom of the screen. This driveway goes back around and connects back to Moselle Road. And this is this the hangar that you were referencing? This is the airplane hangar as we've been referring to it. What is this structure um, on the on the top side of this image in the far back? I uh, believe that was a uh, cleaning shed uh, for a processing shed for animals. Uh, if you're going to process a deer that you killed, it had like a walk-in freezer sinks a uh, floor with drain in it. All right, describe to us what we're, what we're looking at from this perspective, if you would. Certainly. So if you came in the Moselle entrance, which was the entrance that we were dispatched to, the 4147, uh, and you turned by the mailbox off of Moselle Road and you came in the dirt driveway, you would be coming up between the two structures. You have your airport or airplane hangar on your right with the red tin roof, the dog kennel on your left. That was the vehicle that Mr. Murdoch was driving when, we, at least what was, he said he was driving when I arrived on scene. At the time, the flashers were flat. I believe they actually still are in the drone video. The hazard lights are on all the way back from where dispatch initially advised him to cut them on for arrival. The large shed in the background out there is just a simply another tractor shed. And uh, Captain Chapman, is um, would you identify where uh, the body of Paul Murdahl was was located when you arrived on yes, this sir. picture? So the dog kennels on the left of your screen, ladies and gentlemen. If you were to look towards the end of that structure, uh, right where the gravel and the roof line are, and then step back approximately five, six feet. That would have been the location of Paul's body. And where would uh, the bot? Where would Maggie's body have been located? And Maggie's body would have been just beyond the roof line of the red airplane hangar, uh, on the side closest to the suburban. The trajectory of uh, the vehicle that Mr. Murdahl was operating and actually left parked there. Um, would his headlights? Have, where would his headlights have been directed to? As it sits now, which is, I believe is the same it was when I arrived on scene, the headlights were pointed on Paul's body. And this structure uh, just past the white roof, which is identified as the kennels, um, what's that, that run structure there? I believe that was a, like a chicken coop or a chicken pen.
mentioned before when we were talking about the tire tracks uh, that you noticed in the dew of the grass uh, that you were trying to identify the location of those tracks. Um, as part of your investigation in conjunction with uh, Detective Roll, uh, Rutland, did you um, identify this uh, black truck that we see pictured here? We did. Uh, was the black truck, uh, did any of the tracks line up to that black truck? No, sir. That's what got us back to that location looking at the tire impressions was that we were trying to determine if that was the vehicle. We believe that Paul may have driven to the, the uh, kennels. And did you check the truck to see if it was physically warm to the touch or had been it turned off? It was not. Here, um, Captain Chapman, the uh, kennel run, I think you already identified, is that the structure with the white roof? Yes, sir. The, the silverish white roof in the background yes, on this sir. image? And uh, the feed room located where Paul uh, actually was, uh, was sort of straddled, where would that feed room be in this image? If you look at the right uh, corner of that building, and you can see the white frame door just above the red roof, that would be the area of the feed room. And with the court's permission, I'd ask the uh, witness to identify that on the screen, if you would. Yes. Thank you, Your Honor. This would have been the area of the feed room here. This would have been the area of the feed room here. And while you're there, uh, Captain Chapman, would you please identify in this angle where, where Maggie Murdoch would have been located? Yes, sir. Did you become aware through the course of your investigation of uh, footprints on the side of the hangar? Yes. How did that occur? What, was your, what brought your attention to that first and what did you do as a result? Uh, Detective Rutland approached me at some point in time after her arrival with the search warrant that she had located a set of prints. The prints appeared to be uh, a flat style print like a flip-flop or a sandal of some type and that they were to the left of this hangar door in the dirt underneath the left lean-to of the hangar and if you mean to the left of the door uh, in the image um, do, do you identify an orange uh, lawn mower there that's correct in between that mower and the wall if you would uh, describe <clears throat> describe what you did and what you uh, you and Detective uh, Rutland decided to do to examine these footprints. She came over and alerted, alerted me to the presence of the footprints or shoe impressions. I went over with her. We started at the side of the hangar here that you see in the image by the orange mower. At that particular point, you could only see those sets of tracks or shoe impressions in the dirt. We then walked around the other side and you could see that they were also on the other side of the hangar, the far side of that structure. So then we made the decision to walk a line off, the, off of those tracks from one end to the other to ensure that there was no evidence of uh, firearms, blood, anything underneath that hangar along those shoe impressions, which we did not locate anything but the single set of uh, shoe impressions. And they appear to go from one end of the hangar to the other, turn around and come back. I'm going to show you what's been entered to evidence as State's Exhibit 193. Are you familiar with that location? Yes, sir. <clears throat> is that a, a still image of the area between the hangar and that lawnmower? It is, sir. And is that the location where you notice the treads, the, fo the footprints? It is, sir. 
handing you what's been marked as State's Exhibit 194. Could you please describe what you see in that picture? Uh, this is a, a picture of the footprints along the edge of the hangar structure. I'm handing you what's been marked and entered into evidence as State's Exhibit 195. Please describe what you see in that picture. Again, another another photograph depicting the shoe impressions along the edge of the. And wall. those are the shoe impressions that you personally viewed uh, on scene at at Mazel. Yes, sir. I'm also marking, handing you what's been entered into evidence as State's Exhibit 200. Are you familiar with what that is a picture of? These are the shoes that uh, were on Miss Maggie at the time. I believe they're. Uh, crime scene or, or autopsy photos from afterwards. Rear view of the car operated by Mr. Myrtle that night. Is that accurate? Yes, sir. And is that, are those headlines directly aligned with where Paul's body would have been laid? Yes, sir. And from this perspective, where was Maggie's body located? Uh, close to the front of the Green Ranger to the left of the vehicle. <clears throat> and from which direction did Mr. Myrtle indicate he drove to the scene from? Which direction would that have come from? bottom right hand corner of the picture that you're seeing now Chapman, I'm just asking you to identify just very quickly. These are stills from the video feed. What does that show? That's the uh, dirt road between the hangar and the dog kennels. Okay, that would be State's Exhibit 192. <coughs> this is State's Exhibit 191. And what does that show? That's the uh, like we said, a cleaning shed, a uh, processing shed for animals, had a walk-in freezer floor with a drain in it. I'm showing you State's Exhibit 190. What is that uh, image of? Looks like the area of the first two kennels closest to the the does that reflect the two kennels uh, with the two dogs uh, on either side closest to the feed room? Closest to the feed room. Okay. And I'm showing you what's marked as State's Exhibit 189. That's the eight. Is that another close up of the water? That's the close seat? up of the water just outside the feed room. Mm 
And I'm referring to the pictures we just reviewed. This would be States Exhibit 193. Is that where you physically walked with Detective Rutland? It is, sir. And to be clear, when you observed the footsteps in the, in the sand there, were they the only footsteps present? There was only one style of shoe impression when we first observed that went from one side of the hangar to the other and back. And it was that smooth style shoe impression. And you say there and back, does that mean the footprints in, to you indicated they had walked one direction and then walked the opposite direction back? Is that what you're referring to? Yes, sir. We weren't able to tell at which point, which side they entered initially, but they walked completely from one side of the hangar all the way underneath the lean to to the other side of the hangar or turn around and come back. I'm now view showing you what's been view marked as States Exhibit 194. Describe the types of treads we're seeing in this, in this picture, if you could. Certainly. If you remember, I stated earlier that after locating the shoe impressions, uh, Detective Rutland let me know that the impressions were there. I went over, we checked both sides and realized that they ran what we could tell with a flashlight from one side to the other. So we made the decision to, to walk straight through, keeping the uh, shoe impressions that we were concerned about in between ourselves and the wall of the hangar structure, never crossing those actual shoe impressions. We went from one end to the other just to see if they were joined by any other shoe impressions, if there was any blood, if there were any weapons, so forth. We made one trip down and back and we did not locate anything. And I'm now showing you what's been marked as States Exhibit 195. Would that be a close-up of these uh, impressions that you observed? It is, sir. And specifically the items in the uh, middle with the flat tread, um, those were the, uh, those were the, would that be the footprints that you noticed that night? Those were the ones initially identified by Detective Bruntlett and pointed out to myself. The ones with the shoe impressions with the actual designs that would be left of those in this photograph, those are myself and Detective Rutland. Your Honor, I'm gonna to move to publish what's been marked as and entered into evidence as states exhibit 196 and 197. These are images of sensitive nature, have the cover sheet. I'm, uh, I've advised counsel and our table to obscure the <clears throat> monitors showing you what's been marked and entered into evidence as states exhibit 196 are you familiar with what this is an image of yes sir what does this show that's the lower portion of victim Maggie's body okay. and specifically referring to the lower portion of her body but her but her footwear what are you what did are these the footwear that you observed on her that evening that, those are the they appear to be an accurate reflection of what she was wearing the night I was there. Were you able to compare those the general size and shape of those foot treads to the ones that you personally observed on the side of that hangar? General impression, they are similar in nature and design and size. There were no measurements physically taken by myself or Detective Rutman. Thank you. I'm publishing what's been marked and placed into evidence as states exhibit 17, I'm sorry, 197. And this is a similar photograph with just a slightly different angle. Um, is that the same treads and same footwear that you observed previously? Again, that what we believe that what we saw on the side of the building is a, is a very close match as far as design and size as to those. I'm showing you now what's been marked and placed into evidence of State's Exhibit 200. Uh, do, are you familiar with that? that I, I know you already described it, but tell us again what we're looking at. Again, those were the shoes that were removed from uh, victim Maggie's uh, body at the scene and the ones that we were visibly comparing the shoe impressions to. Thank you. Okay. Let me turn the lights on.
<clears throat> did you at one point um, have a, a be on the lookout or a bolo placed on any in particular in the, uh, vehicle that night? Yes, sir. Uh, I believe I explained earlier that we had asked if anything was missing from the scene and trying to determine how Maggie and Paul got to the dog kennels and after checking the F-150 that was in the picture we sh showed you earlier, the dark colored F-150 and that the Ranger had a flat tire, neither one of those matched up. We, I actually asked uh, Mr. Murdoch if he knew how they got down there and he said he wasn't sure but they should have driven Paul's truck which was described as a Ford, a white Ford F-250. We noticed that the truck wasn't there it wasn't up until that point that Mr. Murdoch, I, probably with everything going on, did not realize the truck wasn't there. And at that point in time, to our units at our agency, it was bellowed out as possibly having been taken from the scene or removed from the scene. And what happened? Did, were you able to locate the car eventually? Uh, that, again, that was done sometime that night while we were on scene the very following morning. and. I would have to look back at notes to tell you exactly, but I believe it was around 10.30, 10.45 the next morning, that vehicle was located just inside Hampton County off of Highway 63. Captain Chapman, uh, referring back to the tire tracks, I know you spent some effort trying to identify the source and origin of those tire tracks. When you were <coughs> attempting to investigate those tire tracks with Detective Rutland, did you have a chance to then observe Mr. Murdoch's demeanor. Yes, sir. And we discussed, uh, you know, there were there were changes at the time. What kind of changes? Again, he did appear very upset, uh, heavy breathing, distraught. When we asked the specific questions in regards to the tire impressions, and we began looking at the tire impressions, the it was just a, a change. The, the breathing slowed and he began to watch us work more closely, uh, sometimes out the corner of his eye. And after we moved away from that area with the tire impressions, the demeanor change returned back to upset. Beg the court's indulgence. No further questions from the state. Thank you, Captain Chapman. Yes, sir. Dick Harpoo, and I don't think we've met before. No, sir. Um, I represent Alex Murdoch. And um, let me ask you a couple questions. One, and let me deal with these in a different order. Sir. Um, but you indicated that if uh, Mr. Murdoch had taken the pulse of his, tried to take the pulse of his dead son on his neck, um, or his wrists were under him. Did he indicate to you he had tried to roll uh, his son over? To me, no, sir. Okay. He, did, he did not. Okay, tried to move him at all. Um, secondly, um, if he did get blood on his fingers or hands, were you aware that there was blood found on his shorts? I was not, sir. Again, my op I was asked only about my visible observations and just did not see anything at the time. Right, nothing on a shirt to no, indicate. Sir. Okay. And I was unaware that anything was found. But you're not saying that he, I mean, you didn't see anything that would confirm, but, but he didn't smear That's blood correct. on himself. Right. That is correct. But you're not saying that he, you have evidence he didn't try to check the pulse of his dead son? I am not, no, sir. Okay. Um, So, 
And I think you indicated that his, his demeanor was consistent with somebody who had just found his wife and son butchered. His demeanor upon my arrival and initial conversation with him was one who was of someone who was upset. Okay, now let's talk. Just a moment ago, you said something about when uh, you started looking at the tire tracks on the grass, in the grass. It was a change of demeanor, yes, sir. Well, a change of demeanor that perhaps he thought you had some evidence that would point to the killers of his killers or killer of his wife and child. Are you asking me if that was the change? It, was the demeanor consistent with that? It was simply a change in demeanor. Right. And could, could it be? Yes. Sure, it absolutely could be. It was just a noted change of, in demeanor. He, his interest exactly. perked up. Right. Yes, sir. You were over there looking at tire tracks, and perhaps you had discovered a different car or a different tire track, or and did you follow all those tire tracks? We attempted to follow out everything we could as mentioned earlier it was just impressions do impressions wet impressions not actual tracks did you um, take pictures by the time that we did that the rain started and sled's crime scene was arrived again we were r rushing against the weather the images i believe we discussed earlier were the only ones captured by body cam right and and, and it, it's the body cam is is not our focus at the time was to secure the, the largest items of evidence that were identifiable to make sure that the weather didn't damage them. And by that time, SLED's team was on the scene. Okay, and now there was um, two other sets of tracks, um, one of them coming out of the shed. And I believe your notes indicate that was the caretaker or the caretakers. Now, was that the caretaker that took care of the dogs or somebody else? There was a set of tire tracks or impressions that went through the dirt underneath the uh, hangar right. lean to uh, initially we didn't know whose they were what vehicle had left those tracks in uh, the drone footage you can actually see the agent still processing those uh, believe that later i was told that they matched the tire tracks of someone that came to take care of the dogs okay now we heard from the um, fire chief a little while ago. Were you here in the courtroom when he no, testified? No, sir, I was not. Okay. He indicated that um, there were on the road that led out to the Moselle Highway. You know what I'm talking about? Yes, sir. You know, could we, could we put the uh, drum So, um, were you informed that the chief of police had found some tire tracks on the road leading in uh, or out from to the Moselle Highway behind? And if you look at the screen, this road where the cars are parked on either side of the road, that is that road, correct? For clarification, the chief of the fire department or chief of the police department? I'm sorry, chief of the fire department. I just want to make sure I was answering correctly, sir. Right. Yes. yes, I was not made aware by Chief McRoy of anything back there, but it, it doesn't mean that he didn't see something. He apparently informed your deputies of that. They never communicated that to you? I was not made aware of any tire impressions of potential evidence down that driveway. And um, I think um, Sergeant, is it Sergeant Green? Yes, sir. Indicated that it was communicated to him by the fire chief. Were you aware of that? I was not, sir. Until I just said it, you were not, were not aware of that? I was not made aware of anything that they believe was a, 
a possible extension of the scene that went down that driveway. No, sir, I wasn't. If the fire chief had seen and he was testified he saw distinct tire tracks on that road, he thought it had some evidentiary value. He's not a police officer. Would, had you been made aware of them, would you have taken photographs or I guess they don't use plaster casts anymore. That's we still do. Yes, sir. I would have done my best to preserve it, w whether that meant photographic form or protection by other means from the approaching weather. I would have. Okay. So um, go ahead and let that run for a minute. I may want to stop it and deal with another issue. Okay. Stop it right there. Okay. Yeah, right there is good. Now, if you'll watch where I'm pointing to. Yes, sir. These are the dog, that's the dog shed right there, right? That is correct, sir. And right around in here would have been where um, Paul's body was. Close to the end of that structure, right. yes, sir. And Maggie's body would have been on which side of this, of uh, Alex's car? The uh, end of the red roof on the driver's side. Right, now are you aware and, uh, that he discovered the bodies, called 911, drove back up to the house, and then came back down. From listening to his statement and from the 911 call, I was aware of it. And yes. I mean, he went and got a shotgun, came back. Yes, sir. And the shotgun was there, which sort of corroborates um, his statement, right? I was made aware of that, yes, sir, that Sergeant Green uh, took the shotgun from him upon his arrival and secured it. And you can also hear the seatbelt dinging going on as he drives away, can you not? You can hear that in the background of the 911 call. Right. So this is where he came back, not necessarily when he pulled up to begin with, correct? My understanding that is the way the vehicle was when he returned, returned. and the initial officers arrived on scene. Right. So you don't know where the car was positioned. We first came down and discovered Maggie's body and Paul's body, correct? My knowledge to it would be limited to his description of having taken a very similar route back to the house, right, right, but right. I'd exact, close. close but not exact, yes, sir. Now, um, what is this green hedge or whatever? If I'm not mistaken, it was a grapevine, but the structure on the other side of it, a chicken coop. Okay. And you remember how tall that grapevine was? I don't know exactly, but looking at the uh, image, it's fairly tall. Ten feet? I would say at least. At least. Now, if you were at the house, looking down this way, there's some pine trees between this area and the house? There are, sir. And then there's, uh, if you're trying to look at the, um, at the dog pens, there's obviously a 10 foot at least, um, what'd you call it? The kennels? No, the vine. Grapevines? Grapevines. Yes, sir. 10 feet tall. So you could not see from the house the dog kennel because of the pine trees and the, and the grapevine, correct? I would venture to say you could not see okay. the position of Paul or Maggie's body from the house. At night? At night. Right. And this, this is not a well-lit area down here, is it? I don't recall it being extremely well-lit, no, sir. There was some artificial light, but I wouldn't call it extremely well-lit. Okay. Um, so... Um, go ahead and continue running the video, please. And this was on the next morning? Yes, sir. Okay. Keep going. Okay, stop. That black truck, whose black truck is that? That's the vehicle that we checked that evening that uh, I believe is, was titled as a farm truck, just a tr uh, around the farm truck. And um, is that the one you checked to see if it had been driven lately? 
that's the one that uh, Detective Rutland and I looked to see if those wet tire impressions matched up to the position of that vehicle when we arrived. Those particular impressions did not, and the vehicle was not warm to the touch. Okay, but that would have been the night, previous night? The night of the incident, when right. we arrived, yes, sir. The night pr prior to this. But that, that, could Paul have driven that truck down there? It would depend on what time he drove the truck down there, but he, the impressions that we were looking at that we referenced when asked earlier by uh, the Assistant Attorney General, they did not come to they the back of that vehicle. That. They didn't come from that vehicle. Did he drive that vehicle to the scene? I can't tell you that yes or no, but okay. the impressions that she and I were looking at did not match the position of that vehicle. Right. Yes, sir. But it, Paul earlier could have driven that down there. He could, you, I, it's, it's very feasible he could have driven anything out there that night or earlier in that day, but just not that vehicle for those particular set of impressions. Okay, go ahead. Okay. Back that up just a little bit, please. Back it up a little bit more. Back it up a little bit more. Back it up. <coughs> okay, let it run. Now, stop. So the tracks that you found from the caretaker, where were they? In the image that you're looking at now, ladies and gentlemen, they would have been to the right of the open door in the center underneath that large lean-to section. So the could right you, could side you come of come down here and point it out for me? Your Honor, may I? Yes. Thank you, sir. This section, you can actually see the agent's feet there where she's still actually processing. Okay. Were there any other tire tracks? Any other tire tracks? Go ahead and take it. Thank you, sir that y'all processed other than those tire tracks? To my knowledge, that was the only set that they actually, uh, I believe the only set that they actually processed. By then, uh, the only one left that wasn't damaged by weather as well. Okay, go ahead. Keep going. Stop. So in this road, here goes out to Moselle Highway, right? If you were to take the right T there, yep. by the uh, silver trucks, yep. if you took the right, that would go out to Moselle Road. The left just loops around the airplane hangar. Okay. And if the fire chief had indicated there were tire impressions back here in the dirt, you would have taking pictures or gotten plastic casts or something, right? If I had been made aware that there was something there that someone thought may possibly be evidence, right. I would have done my best to secure it, okay. but I was not made aware of any okay. of that. Thank you. Yes, keep, sir. Keep going. the main house the white building there yes sir it's the Murdoch residence All right. keep going well that's running you would come down that driveway take a left at that road stop and that that if you kept going straight you hit the Moselle Highway right if you continued straight out the driveway with the planted trees on either side that would be a 
separate entrance from the the farm entrance right. it would have been the main entrance to the residence itself off of Moselle Road right the main entrance to come to the residence that's correct if you're going to the residence you'd come in that entrance that is correct you're going down to the dog pens that area the farm area you go you take the entrance with the, the uh, I would assume the, so. the uh, post office box on okay Thank you. Um, let me um, ask you a, a, a few more questions. Um, if I could see. The photos of the, um, the photos of the footwear, the uh, I think the the, the, the uh, flip flops or whatever. In one of your reports, you describe that as it looked to you like someone had been pacing. Is that correct? I did describe it as pacing. I believe. Is that accurate? Simply because it goes down, turns around, and comes back. It doesn't appear to veer off anywhere in between, uh, and there's nothing. It doesn't start anywhere in particular, anywhere in particular. It goes all the way across, turns around, and comes all the way back. Okay, and um, the pictures that, and I'm going to look at them here. Could I have those? Um, the, 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 the pictures that were put into evidence a moment ago. Can I use the Elmo, please? One ninety five. See, are there other pictures in there? <coughs> yeah, no, no, this one. So, as we see in this picture, there you go. Uh, yeah, that's good. Um, we see these flat marks, right? The, that, that would be the flip-flops. The impressions we were following, yes, sir. Yes. So they're like right here and here and here. And, and in some instances, uh, these, these look like, actually, we blew one up, and it's got an REI symbol in the middle of them. Um, and they're, in at least one instance, over one, the flip-flop. Who's that? The only prints that I'm aware of that we could see that night without blowing anything up was the image of the flat shoe wear that you see, and then what Detective Rutland and myself were wearing when we crossed through. Well, were you wearing, that's fine, but I mean, is, is this y'all? Would you have walked over there or here? Presumably so, because those images weren't there prior to us walking through. I don't remember exactly what shoe style Detective Rutland was wearing and myself, but. So, let me put this one up. <coughs> like this, okay. Again, um, can see the pattern of flip-flops, but you also see these patterned boots or shoes over the flip-flops. 
Are you telling me those were not there the night before or you couldn't see them? No, sir. What I'm telling you is when Detective Rutland and I first observed those impressions, there was nothing but a smooth, small, flip-flop style impression, which went down from one end, all across underneath the hanger, all the way to the other, turned around and came back which is the reason that I referenced it as being a pace. Had it simply crossed underneath, I would have just said crossed underneath. But those were the only impressions. Then she and I walked down the shed, keeping those tire, or excuse me, shoe impressions between us and the wall without stepping on them. So those but, are not, I'm sorry. Oh, but we did not photograph them that information from that point was relayed to crime scene because we had not done any photographs of all it, uh, uh, at all at that point. We were waiting on crime scene. So anything else that came through after that would presumably be crime scene that would have come and taken a look at the impressions, yeah, not I'm us. I'm trying to get two issues. First issue, Sir. were those patterned shoe prints there the night before when you walked through? The only print there were the flat smooth ones so those i'm just trying i'm not trying to belabor it so, i'm sorry so those pattern prints came after you saw them the night before correct the okay. only impressions were the flat smooth okay. ones. and you left and turned it over to sled to process the scene while we were there again that, that was at some point in time while we were there that evening i didn't leave until like 10 o'clock the next morning at some point in time, that information was relayed so that they could photograph it. And I don't know whose prints those are. I would assume that they would have been agents that came down behind us and photographed or collected or did whatever. So we were talking about crime scene integrity earlier. Yes, sir. Those aren't your footprints, correct? The ones that are, there is a set that would be myself and Detective Rutland, but, but they're the not ones, going to cross over right, any of not, them. The prints that cross over, they're not your prints. No, sir. If it crosses over one of theirs, it's not mine. Okay. Who took this picture, do you know? I do not know. But it was taken, you think, the next day. It was taken relatively soon afterwards because it still shows the smooth prints. So it was either taken upon daylight, because again, we didn't leave until like 10 o'clock. Right. Um, so I don't actually know. So is this best practices to walk over evidence before you photograph it? Can't say that because it wasn't myself or my detective that did that. I'm just saying um, you. You've if they were doing so while processing or while collecting, then and inadvertently stepped on one, it's okay because they have other ones to use. But uh, you know, I'm sure that you would have to probably ask the person that stepped on them and took the photographs. If one of your detectives had done this, he would not be happy. Correct? I wouldn't be happy, no, sir. Okay. Not unless it was done after it was processed and for a reason. Well, this is the, these are the crime scene photographs taken by, we think, SWED um, um, or um, Swister Duffy Stone took some pictures the next day. Sure. One of some, but some agency other than yours, but certainly nobody ought to be walking across this stuff, right? No, again, like I said, they weren't like that when I, okay. when we were there, sir. Okay. Um, let me then go to one of the other pictures you were showing a moment ago. Oh, um, this water. Yes, sir. Um, these pictures taken of the water. Do you know when they were taken? I'm sorry. Um, 189, 190. Do you know when they were taken? I know they were taking that evening, sir, but I'm not sure if you're looking at stills off of a body cam or an actual crime scene photograph. So I don't know exactly when, but they were taking that evening, obviously. Um, in this picture right here, um, water seems to be coming from the pen, right? From the dog pen? It appears so, yes, sir. And there's two full bottles, I mean bottles, two full pails of water there for the dogs, right? In the picture, absolutely. Okay. And then there's um, some additional water in, and this is 189 that I'm not quite sure where that is, but that's consistent with the water you saw that night, right? Yeah. The water that I saw that night, um, 
and it was captured uh, very well on Sergeant Green's body-worn camera. It came out of the first two kennels, right? Traveled down a short distance, and then over to where, at the time, Paul's body was laid. So the wa the water that was uh, around Paul came out of the kennels, correct? I don't know if that's where it came from, but it did come from that direction. There was, and I did not see a hose or a jug or anything else, but it did tail from those first two kennels down to where Paul's body was. Okay. Now let me, um, so, <clears throat> this is an item under seal. 196. This was introduced to show what shoes she had on, right? Previously, or yes, yes, sir, it was. Now, on the back of her leg, right here, did you that night look at that dirt? I did. Did you see a footwear impression, partial footwear impression, in that dirt? I saw what could very well be a impression. As if somebody uh, put their foot on the back, back of her leg. It was something out of mud that very well could have been a shoe impression. On the back of her leg. On the back of her leg. they put their foot on the back of her leg. Do you know what analysis, if any, was done by SLED or any other law enforcement agency to determine if that was a shoe impression? And if so, what kind of shoe? Do you know? I do not know, sir. Okay. Thank you. You can turn the lights on, and I'll turn. How do I turn this on? Okay. Okay. So um, let me ask you. I got just a couple more questions, maybe. Sorry. Um, So when you um, left that night for that early the next morning, um, had you come to a conclusion as to any suspect? Had I come to no, sir. Okay, are you aware that the next day, the next morning, that your department issued a statement that said, at this time, there is no danger to the public. If information is received that dictates otherwise, we immediately notify the public. Are you aware of that? The Colleton County Sheriff's Office issued that. Colleton County Sheriff's Department, yes. I'm unaware. No, sir. Let me hand this article up to you. From the Post and Courier. Familiar with anything council's referencing? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> 
Okay. was whether he was familiar with the statement made. He said no. The media article contains all sorts of information, not in the record. And not I haven't evidence. heard any exhibit being offered into evidence. Your Honor, I offer into evidence the post you your story of June 8th, the next morning, 2021, which contains the quote, which I've just read. In any case, he's not familiar with it. So, was there a danger to the public the next morning? Were you afraid that some serial killer was out there with a shotgun and an AR type weapon? I can't effectively answer whether or not there's a danger to the public when I don't have all the pieces to the puzzle. I, have, I am fairly certain that statement wasn't issued by us, and the reason I can state that is because we were not primary, and it is a big no-no for us to issue anything when we're not the primary body. So where that information came from, I'm unaware, and it was never asked for me to approve to send to the sheriff. It would have never came from us. So if, if that statement had run, because it did in the post courier on the 8th, would the sheriff's department have pushed back on that and said that's not accurate? Could be a subsequent story I haven't seen. I wouldn't have. I can't state that. The only thing I could tell you that when I left that morning, I didn't have any information that proved one thing or the other. So when you left <coughs> that morning, was Alec Murdoch a suspect in the killing of his wife and son? When I left that morning, I wasn't the primary investigator. He, Who was? That would have been Sled. So you gave the whole, the whole case went to Sled? The whole case went to Sled. We were an assisting body at that time. And you were never consulted after that by Sled? I was not consulted in the sense that anything was provided to me. We have assisted. I have uh, stored vehicles. I have stored uh, property for them. I have stood by while they executed search warrants but it was not in a manner in which the information or knowledge they had on the case was shared with me. It was the exact opposite. On the night of the murders, um, did your department obtain a search warrant? We did, sir. For all the property, the house, all of it? It was, it was obtained for the entire 1,700 acre property. Including the house? Including the house. And was that executed? It was executed at beginning at the Dole kennels at the primary right. scene. But did you go to the house? I did not. Did your department? We did not. Who, who actually executed the search warrant? The search warrant was provided that evening to crime scene, which is standard protocol. When they come, they're going to ask for it. We have crime to show scene, it. Sledge. Sledge crime scene. Okay. It was given to them. And we stayed, myself and several of my detectives. Several were sent home so they could come in the next morning. And we stayed and assisted. I didn't leave till 9 or 10 o'clock the next morning. Did you go in the residence? But no, sir. The drone footage that you saw was the last thing I did at that scene that morning, and then I left and went home. What about that night? When the search, was the search warrant executed that night? I, after that, I had, after that incident there, or that search warrant was executed, I did come back later that day 
and did a walk around of the property that we've been discussing all afternoon, I have never been to the main house. Never been in? I have not been in the main house. Not, some, not during this incident or any other incident. Did someone from your department go in the main house? Not that I'm aware of. It, it wouldn't have been, uh, not as an investigator, let's put that. None of my detectives um, uh, went over there under my direction. So, so, but, so you gave the search warrant to SWAG, the crime scene people. Yes, sir. That gave them the authority to go in the house, correct? It gave them, it was signed off on to cover the 1,700 acres. Right, but I'm specifically talking about the residence. Any structure on, any structure. on that. They any could structure have gone in the residence. They could have looked, taken all his clothes to check if they wanted, right? They could have. Right. I don't know that they, they didn't. Well, I, well, we're going to talk about that later okay. on. They could have, <clears throat> you're familiar with trace evidence, uh, many, many uh, cases where they check showers <clears throat> or the sinks to see if there's, a trace evidence of blood, right? Am I? Yes, sir. Yes. And uh, do you know whether they did that or not? I do not. Again. Do you know um, uh, that you can, <clears throat> with the appropriate um, uh, technology, um, use, uh, look at microscopic evidence, see whether it be blood or tissue, um, or if somebody tried to wash something, you can actually still in, in a, uh, a washed piece of clothing, detect blood or detect tissue even after it's been washed. You aware of that? Am I aware of that? Yeah. Yes, I am. Do you know where the sled did that? I do not, again. But they could have that night done all of those things under that search warrant. Presumably so, and I'm not saying they didn't. Again, Mr. Harper. Well, but they could have. I'm not saying they didn't either. <coughs> yeah. We're going to find out. So, sure. But under the search warrant, your department obtained. They had the authority to go in the house, any of the buildings, anywhere on that property, uh, and look for guns, evidence of, of, uh, of any sort of crime, um, evidence of, again, in the shower, in the sinks, trace evidence. They had the authority to do that. To answer your question, as long as they stayed within the scope of the actual warrant that was signed, I don't have that search warrant, and Detective Rutland is the one that actually got it, if they stay within the scope of that search warrant and they're only searching inside that scope, they had the ability to search structures, vehicles, only 1,700 acres, as long as they're within well, the scope. We'll hear from yep. Detective Rutland tomorrow. Yes, sir. And I'll ask her these questions. Thank you, sir. Having said that, Your Honor, I have no further questions. Any redirect? Very briefly, Your Honor. <laughs> Captain Chapman, the footsteps that you notice, I know we've been through quite a bit of it, but counsel raised this issue. The, tr the, the path you followed, were they consistent with, with someone who, with a person who started <clears throat> back be beyond this area? And then where did they go from there? I'm, I'm asking where they went. Where did they originate? Where did they go to? And where did they end? That's not Objection. Sustain as to the form of the question. Thank you. If you could please explain to us where, the, where in your estimation, having tra traced the tracks, where they originated from, where they ultimately went to, and where they ended up. The shoe impressions crossed completely from one side all the way to the other. With the building to the right going down, coming back the opposite direction. The only reason I can say that we're fairly certain that it started from the grass side and went through, turned around and came back is because we never saw any impressions similar to that 
running beyond the airport hangar on the back side. And the location, where, in, in reference to where these footprints ended, ultimately, and where Maggie's body is located. Where, how did that line up? Describe that, that, how they lined up. If you take a step back from there, to, your, to the right of that image would have been on the opposite side of the hangar door would have been Maggie's body. Referencing States Exhibit 190. Captain Chapman, do you notice blood marks here in the water? Objection, Your Honor. The objection is sustained. Thank you. Did you observe blood marks in the water when you were there that evening? calling for speculation Pardon? he is calling for speculation as to what discoloration uh, in in the water if there is any is That's caused by I'll, I'll lay a more of a foundation your honor captain Chapman <clears throat> were you familiar with the scene as this picture depicts yes sir. did you personally view what this picture depicts I did are you familiar with the discoloration and did you observe the discoloration in this photograph on two different areas? I did see that. Were the, was that discoloration, in your opinion, consistent? Objection. He's not been qualified to give an opinion about this matter. I didn't hear the complete question. In your, in your estimation, in your, in your, your Honor, objection, and if he's going to pursue this frivolous line of questioning, I'd ask the jury be excused. No evidence whatsoever. The objection is overruled. Let's pose the question. In your experience and observation, having observed the scene and all the matter that was there, were those lines in the in the water consistent with blood? Objection. Objection sustained. Thank you. I don't need to be thanked for any ruling. No. I'm sorry, Your Honor. <laughs> I, expressing my gratitude is improper. I appreciate that. Thank all you, Your right. Honor. And I'll ask one, just one last question on the on, and I, I understand the court's ruling captain chapman are the are the substance there that you identified as having observed are they in a straight line are they in straight lines yes <clears throat> thank you the court's indulgence I motion to strike his questions about blood from the record and the jury be instructed to disregard those questions. I've informed the jury that they're to disregard any question when I sustain the objection. They were previously instructed on that. Yes, sir. Thanks. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. No further questions, Your Honor. Any further no, cross-examination? Thank you, sir. You may step down. If you would turn the lights up, please. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, we've come to the end of this day. Thank you all very much. We'll resume at 9.30 tomorrow morning. Have a good evening. Please remember you're not to discuss the case with anyone or allow anyone to discuss it in your presence, nor are you to engage in any or be exposed to any other information other than you, what you have received in the courtroom and will receive in the courtroom. Have a good evening. We're in recess till 9.30 tomorrow morning.